Okay, um, it is 631, so I'm going to call the meeting to order. Um, the first uh, uh, thing is to, well, actually, the item number two is some meeting logistics, uh, so which I'll just run through really briefly so that folks um, know what they are. Uh, so if you are with us remotely, if you could uh, change your names so that it's your first and last name so I know how to properly address you. Um, if you speak at all uh, this evening, if you could uh, say your name and where you live, uh, and I recommend that you keep your comments uh, to two minutes uh, or less, and I'll, we'll um, give you some heads up about that. Donna will help us out with timing of folks. Um, <clears throat> and then uh, if, you're, uh, if you have a particular item that you want to speak to, um, we generally take uh, <laughs> comments uh, when the item comes up. Uh, if it's an item that is not on the agenda that can be um, addressed during general business and appearances. And um, yeah, just make sure that, uh, so uh, if you have multiple questions to ask, just if you could ask them all together, that would be useful. Um, and make sure your comments are germane. All right, that is it uh, about logistics. Um, reviewing and approving the agenda. Any, oh, uh, thank you. Um, the, yeah, the, it's actually not listed here, but we do have, it's okay. One of our um, counselors is joining us remotely. Um, so we wanna just identify uh, folks who are joining us. Well, the counselor joining us remotely. Jennifer, do you wanna introduce yourself? Yes, uh, Jennifer Morton, District 3. I am on Zoom. Okay, thank you very much. All right, so reviewing and approving the agenda. Uh, does anyone have information about uh, changing the agenda. Okay, um, so with that, without objection, we'll consider the agenda approved. Uh, all right, so general business and appearances. This is an opportunity for any member of the public to address the council on any topic that is otherwise not on our agenda. Uh, and uh, again, if you would introduce yourself and uh, keep your comments in two minutes or so, that would be great. Go ahead, welcome. <laughs> Yeah. Oh, oh, actually, maybe a little closer. How's that? I don't think it's on. Give it a second here. Can you give it another test, maybe? Hello? Oh, yeah. There? Am I there? Okay. Yep. Um, hi, my name is Karen Hanron. Um, I've been a Montpelier resident for about 30 years. And I'm going to read what I wrote because I'm really nervous, so I don't want to stumble. <laughs> um, uh, I am wanting to approach the council in hopes of opening a dialogue about the use or the discontinued use of fireworks for holiday celebrations. And here's my written blurb. On July 2nd, I submitted a lengthy post on Front Porch Forum offering information on the dangers of fireworks to bird population, wildlife, home companion animals, people with PTSD and sensory processing disorder, as well as the environment. The personal responses I received flooded my inbox. People wrote about their personal discomfort with the explosions, stories how difficult it was for their pets even moving into the following day, stories, um, a few stories of pets who were injured trying to escape the noise and one story of a woman whose dog was actually killed in the process of fleeing out of panic. Several veterans um, who had been in contact and now in combat um, and now have PTSD responded as well, thanking me for bringing, uh, bringing to people's attention that uh, veterans can have a lot of difficulty with, with fireworks. Um, all to say there was a significant community support for discontinuing the verse of fireworks and finding alternative ways to celebrate. I'm asking the city to consider rearranging how we cohabitate with other living beings and to find ways to celebrate our own existence without harming others and the environment. I am prepared to put together packets for each member of the council if that would be helpful with um, various articles and scientific information on the impact of fireworks on animals, the environment, uh, veterans, people with PTSD, whatever would be helpful for people to consider um, looking at this as uh, something that we can take on as a city. Uh, but I was told to come here first and just <laughs> initiate a conversation. So I'd like to know what concrete steps can we take or can I take to move towards making this change and what that process involves and who oversees it. And I did speak with Dan this morning uh, just to get some further information from him. Great. Thoughts? Yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah. So, yeah, and I, I actually spoke with Karen yes. earlier. She's a constituent there. 
And I, I, I want to plead ignorance. I actually don't know where the funding for the fireworks comes from and who oversees it. So I got some yeah. information from Dan about okay. that. Yeah. 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 So it's, it's <clears throat> part of Montpelier Alive, but they do fundraise for lots. So they fundraise for the event, including fireworks. And I think they get, well, they used to get some of them donated. I don't know if they still do. Yeah. He said there's a lot of sponsors, a lot right. of um, companies sponsor. Um, and I think he said, if I remember correctly, that the city, uh, contributed to 4th of July only. We just contribute so, to the event. Right, to the, to the event, exactly, not right. specifically to fireworks, just to the event. Uh, so this is something that I wouldn't mind taking up as a council as a part of a discussion. Um, other, the other thoughts, anyone else interested in discussing this? Yeah, I, I think it warrants a chat. It might, might be good to like pop into a month till you're alive initially, I think, to talk to mm -hmm. their board and see what thoughts are, because yeah. You know, I know on Front Porch Forum there were some alternatives discussed, you know, to the I talked, loud fireworks. I talked to too, Dan. So get all Dan, the information on the table. Dan too. has looked uh, at those. He's he's looked at drones. He's looked at some other options, and we discussed those as well. Okay. Uh, so if it's all right with the council, I think uh, future a future agenda item. Um, and awesome. we'll also um, maybe check in with, with Montpelier Live about this as well. Um, so Great. can you explain to me this process, like what happens after this? Do you want me to put together packets for you folks so you can read some so information? You could, certainly could please drop or send e my email yeah. to our office. I think it's important to have and that if, information. Yep. And so basically from the head nods, the council saying that they will put it on a future agenda for discussion and then figure out, you know, when we have more time to go into it, decide what they want to do from there. So okay. and we'll obviously let you know and okay. then everybody else know when that's going to be. Very good. Thank Great. you so much. Thank, Thank you. Karen. Okay, anyone else with us in person wish to make a comment? Let's throw that down <laughs> there. That's good. <laughs> Hi, good morning, good evening. Uh, this is Maurice Martineau, 6 Scribner Street. I'm a resident for 26 years. Uh, 25 years ago, I asked for a crosswalk down where Pioneer and River Street merged. And I was told then, and I quote, it will be, give people a false sense of security. Well, we now have that crosswalk. However, people do not see the no right on red sign because it's so small and it's over on the right. I've almost been hit three times. It either as a suggestion to move the sign up next to the street light so people can see it or make it larger. Uh, people aren't seeing it. They're turning in at a fast speed and someone's going to get hit because there's a lot more traffic, foot traffic there, children, etc. Also on River Street, I'm requesting another crosswalk near the Jolly and the used clothing store. There is a crosswalk way at the other end. However, there's no sidewalk on the other side. If a child or as I have seen numerous times, a woman with a child in a carrier waiting to cross, and I've had to stop traffic to allow her to cross. There are numerous families on that side, <clears throat> and there's no way for them to safely cross River Street. And I suggest that that be looked at because there's going to be a fatality there or something very serious is going to occur. Uh, regretfully, I have a seven o'clock appointment that I have to be at. I just would like to say for 30 seconds in reference to the decriminalization of prostitution in Europe, it is used. It is, they have to pay taxes. They have to have a liability insurance. They have to have workman's comp. And if you're gonna go forward with that, please look at these ramifications. And quite frankly, I'm opposed to it and I'll leave it at that. However, it's getting embarrassing when I have a lot of relatives in other states and they just don't believe what we're trying to do. That's Can I ask you a couple of questions, Maurice? Sure. Um, I just wanna make sure that I'm understanding. So uh, the crosswalk, crosswalk at uh, Pioneer Street and River Street, the no turn on red, that's the one coming from Pioneer Street. Is that right? No, coming oh, no, it's from the one Barry, fr or coming from the roundabout. 
Okay, you can't from the see roundabout. that, and it's right at the flag. We'll send that to you to look at that. Okay, it's tucked on the right hand side. Yeah, you can't see it and unless you other, know it's there. And the other um, uh, crosswalk that you mentioned, the sidewalk ends there. It, there it, is no sidewalk. Oh, there is on no that sidewalk. Side, that side of the road. Okay, people cannot cross the street yeah. and use the sidewalk to go to the used clothing store, Jolly, okay. Uttons, anything. Okay. And you've got businesses right there. They cannot cross the street and use a sidewalk to go to those establishments okay. at all. Okay. So Thank we'll you. send our traffic team yeah. out to look at both of those. Yeah. Thank you so much. And just to be clear, if you have comments on um, items on the agenda, um, you can uh, make them when we uh, get there. That's fine. But if it's not on the agenda, now is a good time. Anyone else have a comment that is something not on the agenda? Uh, hey there, I'm uh, Aaron Clark. I'm a resident. Do you mind if I just take this mic off here? So, okay, a little bit short for me. Um, I'm a resident right here in Montpelier. And um, anyway, I, I saw that the agenda, uh, the thing that I'm here for is to talk about the prostitution thing. I know that uh, quite a few people in the room are here to talk about that. Uh, I'm wondering, I know you guys approved the agenda, but I'm wondering if we can move that item closer to the forefront because there's a lot of people here who uh, you know, have early bedtimes. And last time we were here, it went so late. I couldn't believe it. How long these meet, you guys do a lot of work for us. Hey, you guys deserve <laughs> a round of applause. Thank you. Uh, but, uh, but, you know, but we're not going to pay to be here. Right. <laughs> so, I, well, I don't know if you guys are either. But anyway, so I was just wondering a little bit. Okay. Yeah. I'm just wondering if we can move that. Uh, that is a good question. And uh, just by a show of hands, who is here for that item? Oh my goodness gracious. Okay. Um, all right, so let's see here. Um, and a couple of people on. Oh, okay, thank unless, you. Unless they're waiting to speak I in general. I think that, yeah, at least one is, mm -hmm. I think, waiting to speak. Um, I think we could potentially move it to after GMT. Mm -hmm. um, yep. I should do the GM, unless. Yeah. Probably. Yeah. So um, we'll move it up to um, right after the the uh, GMT My Ride update, which is item six. Uh, so we could call this item like six and a half. Uh, so, okay. Thank you for that. Any anyone else um, have a comment on something not on the agenda? Um, really shortly. Yes, yes. Yeah, I can hear myself. Okay, anyway. Um, yeah, I just had a quick glance at the agenda um, and I was trying to find if, you know, there's any discussion about this area where we have the garden box, uh, the lovely garden box installed right by Shaw's here on the corner here. Um, I, I don't know if you guys are planning on discussing plans for that area, are. fielding public opinion or yes. when I can participate in that discussion if it's yes. planned out. Is it a meeting? Um, it is, agenda. it is on this agenda. Oh. Um, it's quite a bit later, but yeah. yes. It's called 12 to 16 main street on the agenda. Okay. All right. That's great. Excuse me. Could you identify yourself? My name is Thomas Fallon. I live here in Montpelier. Thank you. Okay. Anyone else with us in person, uh, wish to make a comment? Okay. So we will turn to folks who are with us, uh, virtually, uh, Peter Kelman, go ahead. Uh, Peter Kelman, I live in Montpelier. I just want to second Karen Hanron's uh, request uh, about the fireworks, but I would like it to be extended to uh, be a conversation that is not just about the fireworks on the 4th of July, but fireworks uh, in, in the downtown area uh, in general. That would include New Year's Eve, if that's um, up for uh, uh, conversation, and also National Life doing it. Um, at their good uh, works festival um, and people doing it uh, apparently, you know, <laughs> randomly. Um, uh, so I think there needs to be a conversation about uh, loud explosive fireworks in general. And I assume there's an ordinance about it, about, about how late it can be, et cetera. If there isn't, I'd like that to be on the table as well in this conversation, not just about 
uh, 4th of July. Thank you. Thank you. And just so you know, that is how I understood the, the conversation. Um, so I think we're good there. Um, thank you. Uh, Ashley Strobridge, go ahead. Hi there. Yes, I'm also here to, I guess, third um, Karen Han, um, I forgot her last name now. Henry. Um, uh, yes, Henry, about the, um, about the fireworks. Um, they are so hazardous to so many population. I mean, wildlife, um, pets, so many pets get lost and, and even have heart attacks, um, including wildlife also, um, you know, uh, die from this. Um, and people with PTSD, whether it's veterans or, um, uh, you know, people who have had domestic abuse uh, situations, like there's just so many people and animals and environmental hazards that this affects and negatively and and for what I mean for what 20 minutes of things blowing up in a in a somewhat beautiful way <laughs> like is it worth it I mean how many things are we harming so I, I I definitely you know I'm I'm on board with what Karen is is proposing so yeah thank you um anyone else with us uh virtually wish to make a comment okay all right, well, thank you, everyone. And oh, yes. Oh, sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Just like to introduce, uh, we have our new communications commute coordinator, Evelyn Prim, is here. Evelyn works for us part time. We'll be working at least through this year as we sort our way through helping with our website and other things and decided to brave tonight's meeting in person to meet people and see how it all, all goes. So I just wanted to introduce her to all of you. Yay. Thank you. Well, welcome, Evelyn. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, so we're going to move on then to the consent agenda. Um, is there a motion? I move the consent agenda. Um, I would like to propose that we take out item H, the stormwater utility contract, uh, not for further discussion tonight, but um, for another time, um, because that it's a it's probably worth more discussion, unless folks want to move forward, but I, that's, which would be fine, but I think it's worth discussing. Um, is it? Uh, yeah. I'll just say being on that committee, oh. that I was going to make sure that I commented how much work oh. that Zach and Kurt both did on this and the committee and thought it was very, very thorough. So oh, I'm surprised that oh, you don't oh. want to pass it. Well, I, uh, so that's not to say that I don't want to pass it because I do. Um, it just feels like a weighty enough topic that I think it's important that the public understands the implications. Um, but I will leave that to you all. Do you want to move to remove that item? If not, that's okay. But well, It's a yeah. contract to, to do the plan. And so the public will have lots of input while the process is ongoing. And I may be wrong, but I thought there was some concern of dates, but um, well, maybe I'm misunderstanding. You want to just pull it off tonight? Okay, so and just and then decide if you want to do. Okay, that that seems good. So if we maybe we could pull it off tonight for some discussion um, to see if we can pass it tonight. Is that okay? Okay. Um, so I think we might need a. I would move to amend my motion to uh, pass the consent agenda with the exception of uh, item H. Second. Okay. Um, so voting on the uh, amendment. Um, further discussion? Okay. I'll well, just note oh. for the record that you're voting on accepting the Murray Hill water system, which has had a lot of work done as well. Jim Tringe is here and this, Kurt both did a huge amount of work. Well, to be fair, this is the vote on the amendment to, to pull this item off. Yes. Oh, I thought you just had changed your motion. Never no, mind. that just <laughs> the way Jack framed it. It's okay. <laughs> Um, <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Um, all right. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Uh, and so that's unanimous. Um, so now it's without item uh, H. And so yes, <laughs> including the item um, regarding the Murray Hill water system. I'm very grateful um, for everybody's work on all of that. Um, oh, if you would like to speak to that, um, that's perfectly fine. Welcome. 
I'm Jim Tringe. I'm a Montpelier resident and um, just want to, it's been 47 months since we really first approached <coughs> Connor and Jack. Yeah, approached, you know, the city with this pr proposal to join the Montpelier water system. And with tonight's approval of this item, we will become part of the system. So that's very exciting for the 81 and counting uh, connections on Murray Hill. So thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I just want to uh, recognize Jim Tringe for all the work he's done over, over all these years. I know that it's been like, uh, having another full-time job for Jim to, to carry this over the finish line. Connor and I <clears throat> met with him years ago and uh, ooh, I met with the, with the residents and it's gonna be beneficial both for the residents of Murray Hill and, uh, and for the city. And so glad to see this finally uh, brought to a successful conclusion. And hats off to DPW staff who worked like also Kurt and his team. Okay. Uh, all right, any further discussion about the consent agenda? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And oppose. Oh, okay. <laughs> I wasn't wanted to, wait, I got you though. Okay, Jennifer votes aye. Um, and opposed. Okay, so that is also unanimous. Mm -hmm. um, and so that, passes. Uh, thank you, um, everybody, for all of that. And just so folks know what at least I'm thinking, um, I think we could take up the um, discussion about the stormwater utility uh, maybe right after the district heat rates, um, since that's kind of sure. similar folks probably talking about yeah. that. Um, OK. All right, so we are up to. Uh, an update from Green Mountain Transit. And so for this, um, I am not sure if the person from Green Mountain Transit is with us virtually. I they are am. Virtually. Oh, you were here. Oh, you, there you are. Hello. Good. Hello. Um, good evening, everyone. My name is Jamie Smith. I am the Director of Marketing and Planning for Green Mountain Transit. Um, and if it's okay, I'm going to share my screen um, and speak to you all a little bit about uh, our on-demand microtransit system in Montpelier, uh, MyRide. Let's see. All right. Can everybody see my screen okay? Yes. Great. Um, so for those of you who are not familiar with My Ride by GMT, uh, this is a flexible route, flexible schedule system that we operate in Montpelier, um, parts of, of Berlin, um, and a very, very small sliver of Barrie. Um, it is a service that's sort of Uber for public transportation, um, and it replaced some fixed route service that we were operating in downtown Montpelier. So the Capital Shuttle, the Montpelier Circulator, and the Montpelier Hospital Hill. Uh, that service began January 4th, 2021. Uh, this is a, just a service map that sort of shows our uh, service area. Unlike our fixed route service, uh, this just operates in a nine and a half square mile radius instead of on a linear uh, fixed route like the previous services. Uh, and so I, I brought some high level metrics today, um, and then I have some, some other items to discuss about some temporary service reductions that GMT um, initiated this week. But to date, uh, the MyRide service has provided over 48,000 rides, um, which is impressive as we launched this service um, in the middle of a pandemic uh, without a lot of opportunity for in-person uh, communication with riders and travel training. Uh, to date, we have about 1,451 active riders. So these are folks that have booked at least one trip in the MyRide system. Uh, we, are, we have an average utilization of uh, three, which is the amount of trips that it can be completed by each of our three vehicles uh, per hour. And so far, uh, our on-time performance has been fairly great, hovering right around 91%. Um, so that's folks being picked up within five minutes of their communicated pickup time. And the met demand rate, so 97% met demand means anytime somebody 
calls GMT uh, or uses the app and says, this is when I want to be picked up 98 or 97% of the time, the trip that is presented to them meets their needs. So it works within the schedule that they're requesting. Um, so you can see here, our completed rides show our sort of month over month growth. Um, and this was this data was pulled uh, partly through May. Um, so you can see that's not a complete month. But in April of 2022, uh, we saw, or sorry, March of 2022, we saw our highest ridership uh, month with 3,341 rides. Um, this exceeds our sort of pre-pandemic fixed route ridership um, by quite a bit. Uh, most fixed route services across the state are still operating probably 40 to 50% uh, below the ridership prior to the pandemic. Uh, so this slide shows our rider growth, um, which the darker blue on top is our returning riders and the lighter blue on the bottom shows new riders every month. And so you can kind of see month to month that conversion of new riders to returning riders. Um, and it's, it shows you know, that folks, most folks who are trying the service are at least attempting to, to use it um, again in, in future months. Uh, I threw this slide in today just as a comparison. There have been lots of questions about recently that have come up about our former fixed route services. So um, in, FY20, in FY19, uh, that was our last ridership year where all of our services were operating unaffected by COVID-19. Um, so all three, Montpelier Hospital Hill, Montpelier Circulator, and the Capital Shuttle, their combined ridership for FY19 was 51,700. 37. So my ride uh, is hovering in terms of trip requests right around that number. Um, there are some factors that that go into uh, not fulfilling that request. So our, you know, the met demand rate is at 97%, as I mentioned. So that 3% of trips uh, don't happen for whatever reason. Folks have to cancel. Folks uh, no show, they get a ride, they do something different and they don't end up taking that trip that they've booked. Um, and then for comparison's sake on the bottom, the six months leading up to the launch of my ride service, uh, Montpelier Hospital Hill and Montpelier Circulator ridership was uh, 10,674. Uh, I threw this in so folks could see what the most popular pickup and drop off destinations um, are so most folks are using the service from you know to get back and forth to the Berlin Mall area, um, Montpelier Shaws, Berlin Shaws. Um, you can really see that about forty five percent of all trips are going from downtown Montpelier out to the Berlin Mall area. So it really speaks to the need that folks have for you know medical, grocery um, trips, and essential trips. Since the launch, from the launch through April, um, we were seeing a high trend of folks who were calling GMT and using our call center to book their trip. Almost half of folks uh, were hesitant to use the app or didn't have access to the app. Um, but I threw in this next slide that shows April and May where we saw a huge trend, um, an uptick of people using the app and that trend has continued um, into June and July uh, where we're seeing the number of folks booking through our call center dropping down and as more folks become familiar and comfortable using the MyRide by GMT app. Uh, I threw in some benchmark data. I know that there have been some questions that have been um, sent to the city of Montpelier about uh, seat unavailable or folks trying to use the service. Uh, and not being able to get a trip. Um, so I, I showed here that, you know, unavailable, seats unavailable is about 3%. Um, that's far below the global average. Um, these, these gray lines indicate all uh, services operated by VIA across the world. Um, and you can see sort of down here, this little red line is my ride. So the average seat unavailable rate or percentage of time somebody is not able to use a service like this usually is about 10%. 
Um, so my ride is sort of exceeding that global average. Uh, and again, this is benchmark data. So the, the lines represent um, all of VIA's deployments. Um, this is the acceptance rate. So about 96% of the time when somebody is given a proposal or given a, a trip um, option, they're accepting that. Um, that's far above uh, the average of 81% um, from other systems. So it, it really speaks to, uh, you know, when folks are trying to book into the system overwhelmingly, um, they are accepting the times that are given to them uh, by the service. Uh, this past Monday, uh, July 18th, as many of you probably know, uh, GMT put in place some temporary service reductions um, due to some staffing challenges that we are having. Uh, we had four longtime operators retire all at the same time, <laughs> which um, is about 30% of our workforce in central Vermont. Uh, so I've been looking at just for the last couple days, um, what has this done to the MyRide service where we're operating one fewer, uh, one less vehicle in the morning and one less vehicle in the afternoon, um, which are our peak times of service. So you can see um, the wait times or the ETAs are increasing uh, quite a bit. And again, this is just a two day snapshot and we hope um, this starts to level out as folks are able to plan for some of these um, supply reductions, but you can see the darker blue line indicates um, an increase in the in the wait times when people are requesting. Um, and it's by time of day. So eight o'clock, seven to nine o'clock is roughly our our peak uh, morning peak and four to 6 p.m. in the evening um, is our highest ridership time. And that's generally when we see folks having uh, the most challenge um, booking into the system or being offered a ride. Uh, just what we're working on in the future, uh, we have been working very closely with our operators um, and our, the staff that works with us from VIA um, to identify some of the challenges that are still occurring with the service. Um, how can we make improvements to get some of these numbers up and to make sure that folks are getting um, you know, rides when they need them, where they need them. And so we've been spending a lot of time um, looking at the testimonials from riders, drivers, um, and submitting that product feedback to VIA. And they are actively working on some tools to help improve the MyRide service. Um, and then we've made some slight alterations to the app um, on the operator side, which uh, just will continue to improve um, the efficiency of the service and will reduce some of the, um, if you're familiar with some of the comments made about my ride, some of that back and forth that people feel like they're experiencing where they, the bus drives by their location to double back and drop them off. Um, so continuing to make some of those uh, app improvements to hopefully uh, improve my ride service in the future. And that's all I have, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Great. Uh, great. Uh, thank you, Jamie. Uh, any questions? Uh, Connor and Donna. Right. Just a couple there. First off, I, I want to thank you, Jamie. Um, you know, everything I've heard is you've been incredibly respons uh, responsive to constituency groups who have reached out to you. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm a strong believer in the program. I think it's sort of the future of public transportation. Um, you know, somebody lives off Town Hill Road or something has mobility issues um, or a low income family, you know, suddenly they, they have an option to, to get into town and do what they need. So I, I'm really excited about this. Uh, a couple of questions. Um, so the 10% the that you say, when it says like, um, you, you know, folks can't get the ride. Um, does that include like, if I go on the app, I've had a number of times where it says no drivers are currently available. Uh, so that would be logged in that 10% number? Correct. So for clarification, say, Connor, the, the number that my ride is experiencing is 3%. The global average is 10. So we're 
you know, 3% of the time folks are not able to get a trip in the MyRide service. But yes, that would be included if it says driver unavailable um, or there's no proposal at this time, that's all captured in that 3%. Okay, great, thanks. Um, and uh, could you give just a quick, like sort of 10,000 foot view of what the legislature decided last session there? Because it looks like uh, there's talk of expanding to Barry, maybe some other areas in the state. And I think my concern is if we're having trouble with driver retention, you know, it's sort of in the same small radius Barry there. Uh, so if we're covering a bigger area, how would that work with like driver recruitment? Sure. Uh, so the legislature did pass the House Transportation and the Senate Transportation passed some funding for additional microtransit services. Um, that money was awarded to uh, Vermont Department um, of Transportation, Vermont Agency of Transportation. Um, and they have contracted across the state uh, 12 feasibility studies to look at different areas of the state where these services might be implemented. Um, and one suggestion by VIA who conducted those feasibility studies is using smaller uh, non-CDL vehicles. And so right now there's a challenge with uh, recruiting CDL drivers. It's a arduous process to get your CDL. There's um, lots of lots of training involved, uh, which GMT does provide, um, but getting folks CDL drivers specifically in the door has been a challenge. So we are looking at not offering my ride service with the same uh, buses that we're using in Montpelier, but moving to a smaller van um, where we could recruit drivers, either a, a mix of part-time drivers who, you know, who you know didn't need a CDL or some full-time non-CDL drivers, which we think will help with, uh, with recruitment. Great, and last question, Jamie. Um, I think Elizabeth may have sorted this for me, but I've had some healthcare workers um, just express some concerns that folks with mobility issues have tried to um, get rides to, like the integrated uh, healthcare center in town. And because it was in the sort of small radius there that would be walkable for other folks, mm -hmm. uh, they were denied the ride. But my understanding is folks would have to call there and you could waive that, right? It's uh, we have actually changed the parameters of the system. So there is no minimum uh, travel distance at this time. That was something that was happening sort of early on in the system, um, but that has since been resolved. Fantastic, thanks, Jamie. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Donna, go ahead. I just want to comment again, Jamie and the crew and the Sustainable Montpelier Coalition have all been really putting extra customer service into this service. And without that, I don't think you would see the ridership, let alone the increase in using the app. Um, but it is hard with lack of drivers. So I appreciate you filling us in. I also comment that the committee that goes with this has been meeting regularly. Peter uh, Kelman is one of those who shows up. It's been about bi-monthly bi mostly that we've been meeting and they've been following up on the data and asking good questions. Um, so, and I really appreciate that you've actually focused the statistics today so they're more absorbable, but there are even finer tuned ones if people are interested. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jamie. Thanks, Donna. Uh, Jack, go ahead. Uh, thanks for this presentation. Um, I know that I've heard uh, people from outside of uh, city council meetings and, uh, and people communicating at city council meetings that the system just doesn't work for them. And uh, so I'm, for one thing, I'm just concerned that the 97% uh, success rate may not be capturing people who have tried to get rides, tried to make something work, and have given up. So they're not uh, any longer even trying to get a ride. Uh, my recollection when we started was that uh, there was talk about some kind of uh, hub or terminal going to be placed downtown at Shaw's or someplace so that someone there needing a ride would be able to log on there and, uh, and request one. And I don't know where, uh, I don't think that's happened, but I certainly don't know. And I wonder if you could comment on that. 
Sure. Uh, we have been discussing the possibility of uh, accessibility phones. So those would be, you know, freestanding stanchions like you might see on a college campus um, with a phone system that would ring into the GMT call center. Uh, and we would place those at high ridership stops. Um, we have been working with VTrans uh, and some of the business owners, like for example, uh, Berlin Mall and trying to figure out um, the permissions and, and the permitting that we would need um, and what that would look like staff wise uh, to min maintain a system like that. Um, one item that we were able to accomplish in the last few months was uh, there's a period of the day uh, where our Montpelier Transit Center is not staffed and we have put a speaker phone system, one of these um, phone systems in our transit center. So if there isn't a customer service rep available um, in the middle of the day, folks are still able to call in and book a trip um, from the Montpelier Transit Center. So that is something, um, thank you for bringing that up. That's something we have recognized as a challenge um, and we are working toward um, trying to find a solution for that, for that issue. Thanks. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. Yeah, thank you so much for this. Um, I really appreciate seeing the level of detail that you provided, and um, I've been kind of, you know, wondering exactly how it was going. So I appreciate all those statistics, and I'm glad to see the level of ridership is as high as it is. Um, partly because, perhaps similar to Jack, what what I the feedback that I tend to get from folks in the public is that uh, the times when it's not working for them, and so I am wondering about um, who is being served and who is not being served. And I'm, I'm concerned that there may be kind of a whole section of the population that is feeling like uh, if I, uh, like, like this doesn't work for them. Um, so I'm, I'm wondering if you have kind of a sense of how people are using it um, and who is, who might have been using public transportation before that is no longer using it. I don't know how you would find that out, but I'm curious yeah. about that. Um, and then I, I have a more specific question about the um, the wait times and that you said that most of your rides, people are getting picked up within five minutes of their scheduled time. And so my understanding, and perhaps I'm wrong about this, is that when you have a time offered to you, there's a 15 minute window on either side of it. So it's really, from what I understand, it's a 30 minute window. And so is that five minutes again on either side of that? So are we talking about a 40 minute window when you, your ride might come or maybe you can just explain that part sure. to me a little bit more. Sure, absolutely. Uh, it's actually, when you are given a time, you're given just a 15 minute pickup window. So if you were to look in the system and say, I want uh, a trip at noon, the system looks forward 40 minutes and backwards 20 minutes and it will offer you a proposal somewhere within an hour of uh you know 40 minutes ahead of noon and 20 minutes back um, and it will offer you a good better best option so it might say something like we can pick you up between uh 12 and 12 15 um, the next option might be 12 30 and 12 45 um, it gives you choices uh for rides that are as close to your requested time as possible. Um, so at the time of booking, you do get a 15 minute pickup window and then your ride will never be, you will never be picked up outside of that window. And there are various uh, levels of communication. So uh, the night before your scheduled ride, you, you would get a text message saying your trip is scheduled for, um, say noon to, to 12.15 was your pickup window, you'll get an actual physical time. So it will say the bus will arrive at your location at 12.08. And then you'll never, so when I say within five minutes, it's five minutes of that 12.08 time. All right. All right. Uh, and then in terms of, of riders, certainly uh, we have heard from some folks who either don't have access to technology or don't, are not comfortable with technology who really just want a fixed route service. They, they want to know that this is the schedule. The bus is always gonna be outside at 15 minutes after the hour. Um, but we definitely have, a, a, I think, a high percentage of riders who 
would never have used fixed route service for that very reason, because there was no flexibility. If they missed the bus, it was another hour until a bus came. And so because we don't have uh, that specific data, we are working on a plan uh, for the month of September to do uh, very in-depth surveying. We're hoping to host um, some informal uh, sort of town hall st style meetings at our transit center where folks can come and just give us that feedback so we can identify, uh, is this service meeting the needs of folks who need it the most? And are there solutions um, for example, would it make more sense to bring back a Montpelier Hospital Hill fixed route service given that nearly 50% of people using my ride are sort of using that, that former routing. Um, so that will be happening in September and hopefully uh, we'll have a feedback report that we can share um, with City of Montpelier and our other stakeholders and partners. Our, our MyRide Advisory Council and our board um, moving forward with a plan um, in October. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anna, go ahead. Uh, Jamie, is there a phone number you could give that counselors could pass on to people that when they have difficulties, they can call? Because I know you walk through, help people walk through the system to make it work better. But what's the key number they should call? Sure. So our number is uh, 802 223 seven two eight seven and that will get you into our phone system um, and connect you directly with one of our customer service reps thank you mm -hmm. great um other questions or um anyone from the public wish to comment on this okay uh and i see we've got a hand from peter kelman go ahead uh peter kelman montpelier i am on the uh my ride uh, community, um, uh, community advisory committee or group, as we call it. Um, thank you, Jamie. Uh, I, I think what's very important about what Jamie has presented here is that it shows that this pilot project, which is what it has been, is very much a data-driven pilot. We're finding out what is working, what isn't working. Uh, Jamie has other statistics that drill down into some of the questions that were asked. But I think that we all know that the squeaky wheel gets the grease. You guys, Jack and, and, and uh, uh, Carrie, you hear from people who complain. You don't hear from people who are happy. People don't call you up and say, oh, wow, this is a great thing, okay? But it is a great thing. And, most pe and the, the data shows that increasing number of people using it and the people who are using it are coming back and using it some more. Now, 3% is a very small number, but it represents some real people. Of course it does. Some people, this isn't working as well for them. And there, there are some indicators. For example, people who need to get to work at a certain time or to school at a certain time in the morning, which is the heaviest uh, period uh, of time. Those are the people who probably are running into most problems, although some of it may have to do with the way they book. They need to book about selecting their time of arrival, not their time of pickup. Now, maybe that's not the problem, but that's, that is one of, the, one of the issues. And so again, drilling down, uh, uh, GMT is finding out more about what is working, what isn't working, and we are all, we discuss this, actually, we meet more than by, uh, we meet most, sometimes once a month, but we meet frequently and we have uh, emails with Jamie and with Sustainable Montpelier so that we're constantly working on these issues that come up. I urge the counselors not to be swayed by the people who gripe. I'm not saying to tell them to go away, but tell them to call up GMT, like, like Donna said, but believe me, this thing is working. And it's very important to have the support of the council on that. Thank you. Thank Anna, you. Oh yeah, go ahead, John. Follow up question. Peter, thanks for making that point. And uh, during the presentation, I had a question that you reminded me of. Uh, if somebody has a need for, uh, for a regular or recurring service, 
is it possible for them to, I, I've just used it a few times, is, is it possible for someone to set up a regular appointment, like I need to be at, uh, at work at nine o'clock every morning, or I need to be at my uh, doctor 11 o'clock every Thursday. Is it possible to set something like that up? It is, and it's also possible to book your trips for four weeks at a time. So um, there's quite a bit of uh, leeway there in, in how you book and how often and how frequent you, you can set up your trips. Thanks. Great, thank you. Any other questions folks have about this? Okay, not seeing anyone else. So thank you so much, Jamie. Uh, this was uh, really helpful and uh, yeah, look forward to further conversation about uh, the MyRide system. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening. You too. All right, so uh, we are, we've changed our schedule around. So we are gonna be taking up the um, first reading of the repeal of the prostitution ordinance uh, right now. So I'm gonna officially open the public hearing um, on this uh, ordinance change. Um, and I don't know that there's anything we need to necessarily say up here first, unless you, you've got Just something. Very quickly, by background, we did have a lengthy discussion about this. And at the conclusion, the council asked that we warn first reading for repealing this ordinance and also took a sort of a policy statement action. Um, so this was, the, it was actually, I will confess that it wasn't clear in the motion whether you meant to repeal both sections or just one, but I took it that you meant both. So I, I put them both in for, because there was the prostitution and the house of prostitution. But you can always change that. Okay. Um, so as as this is a public hearing, unless and any counselors wanna make some comments before we hear from the public, I think we should just go right to the public. Uh, and we'll start with folks who are here with us uh, in person. So if you uh, wish to make a comment about this, um, now's the time again, if you would say your name, where you live and try to keep your comments to two minutes and Donna here will help us uh, with that timing. So thank you so much, yeah. Okay, um, can you hear me? Is that on? Yes. Okay, uh, my name is Aaron Clark, uh, resident here in Montpelier. Um, so I would like to suggest to the council that we uh, change the city ordinance to match the state ordinance language. Uh, I think that there's a lot of good reasons for that. I can just give you two reasons. I also have a question with those reasons uh, that I'd like to hear an answer from for you guys. Um, the first reason uh, is basically, you know, I, well, I'll start with this. I, I've heard a lot around this. A lot of people are saying, you know, we don't need a city ordinance be for this kind of thing because murder, for example, is not on our city ordinances. Why would we have prostitution? Uh, we're just going with what the state says. Uh, well, that makes a lot of sense, except uh, we don't see the state ordinance enforced. I mean, we were right here just a few weeks ago and we heard people saying, I sell my body for sex. I am a prostitute. And, was the, and here was the police chief right over here, five feet away. Here was all of you guys. Here's, it's on public record. And what kind of enforcement was there for that? There was no enforcement for the state ordinance. And so clearly, if we're not even enforcing the state ordinance, I think that, first of all, I, I wonder why aren't we, that's kind of my question, first of all, is why are we not enforcing the state ordinance? Why is our police not doing anything when we hear people say, who are not being subjected to this, they're not being trafficked in this, but they're saying, this is who I am, this is what I'm about. Why are we not enforcing this? Right, before I get to the second reason, I just wanna hear from you guys about that. Um, I don't think I have any comment about that at this point. I mean, so I guess my recommendation is, is to keep going at this point, unless folks wanna answer. Okay, yeah. Yeah, because it's a it's very a good question. It's a very hard question to answer. <laughs> well, <laughs> exactly. So which is why easy. I would say like, yeah. I, I don't, yeah. Ask all your questions at once, yeah. and then and then we'll keep going. Okay. Well, and and that's basically, I mean, I, that's my one question. But the second reason um, is because essentially, if we get rid of this ordinance language and we don't replace it, when the state this there's a movement right now to change the laws around the state, and so when that a lot of people are saying we don't need to remove the city ordinance language because the state ordinance language is there. Well, it may not always be there because our city ordinance languages are changing. There are movements to change this. So when the state ordinance language is gone and it could be gone, 
uh, well, why do, can we not have some extra security here for our city to say, well, here in this place, it will not be. We do not want that here. We're making a value statement. Like here, Montpelier, we don't want consensual prostitution. We don't want it, want it, it, we don't want what it brings in, which is sex trafficking and human trafficking. Um, why can't we put that, uh, yeah, to, to stop that? So those are my two reasons. There's my question. I, I would like to have an answer at some point if, uh, if anybody would like to email me or talk to me or something. Why are we enforcing this? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Diana Tierney, and I live right in Montpelier. And I just like to, you know, I'm concerned about the youth and their relationship with drugs and people vulner vulnerability. And in Vermont, there was an article, um, you know, that the, this is an old article. Attorney General's office has dropped prostitution and drug charges against a Boston youth arrested over the weekend when police cracked what they called a homosexual prostitution ring. Two men and a 16 year old boy who were arranged today were picked up early Sunday at the Andrews Inn in Bellows Falls for a gathering place for gays. So I am worried how we as a community are gonna prevent people from vulnerable people from being caught up with others who might um, take advantage of them. And you know, when we were in high school, we used to hang out in, in the combat zone and bought just to have some fun in the combat zone. You know, we were lucky that we didn't get into trouble doing that. We thought it was a joke, but it's not. Um, then here's an other article, um, a Burling, Burlington police said Friday with the arrest of a local man, they have broken a Chittenden County prostitution ring that allegedly involved as many as 10 teenage females. So I'm just concerned about um, people getting caught up in this who are vulnerable. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is John Matthew. I'm from Barrytown. Uh, and uh, I am opposed to any changes to this ordinance uh, that is existing. Uh, presently, I've read this uh, ordinance and I feel that it is strongly uh, uh, shows exactly what we do not want in this community. Uh, and I wouldn't want that to come to Barrytown or Barry City or actually any other city uh, in the state of Vermont. Uh, I lived in Tampa, my wife and I did for eight years. We saw exactly what uh, prostitution does in that city. And it took a, uh, an act of, uh, of the legislature out of Tallahassee to write what was wrongly put in place in Tampa. And I certainly don't, would not want to see any of that kind of stuff take place here in Vermont, any city. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, um, my name is Rebecca Savoya. I live in Williamstown. Um, this is a very important topic to me. I've worked in counter human trafficking and in the, um, with, with people in the sex industry. I've seen the effects that it's had in nations that have become a sex tourist destination, such as Bangkok. And um, I, I just want to appeal that that you know the well-being of the women and men. I know we both have the same desire to see them protected, and that's the most important thing. But if we look at um, statistics, it, there's so much crime and violence that's associated with that. And I know the idea is to get protection for them, um, but even PTSD, studies show that PTSD levels with people that work in the sex industry is comparable to those of war veterans or people who have been tortured. 
um, we see that, that violence levels just in the US is 58% report that they have been abused or raped. Mortality rates, it's the only job where mortality rates and abuse is so high. So I just wanna urge us that even for, I'm a mom, a foster mom as well. And you know, I urge us that we, we look into the repercussions that this means for our community. Um, just one moment, okay, sorry. Yeah, good. yeah, the, uh, the repercussions that it means for our community and our kids, um, we are worth more than just the sale of our body. And I, I strongly believe that. And I wanna raise kids that, that realize that yes, their body is worth something, but their intellect is worth something as well. Their emotion is worth something as well. If we look at prostitution, most people that enter into prostitution enter at the age of 14. And it is not because they have other options. It's not the best option. It's the lack of options that has pushed people into this job. I know there's, there is a, um, this persona that it's, it's freedom. And in a sense, yes, maybe that is freedom. However, it, it's lack of opportunity. So my appeal to us is that maybe we look at how we can give them better opportunity as opposed to just bringing protection that in turn doesn't actually bring a whole lot of protection. And I've seen the effects of prostitution, um, human trafficking brought to that as well. I don't wanna go too far. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I do have a question before I start. Um, could you give a clarification when I finish or before we finish the discussion on how you're calling this a public hearing in the terms that you use? Because I'm seeing, I think you're calling it first reading. So I'm not sure that everyone might understand that it's actually a public hearing. It's your first of two public hearings. And could you also clarify how you warned that and where it was posted? And, and if you typically just call them a first reading and a second reading, so we would know in the future how to how to do that, that would be great. I'm gonna do script because that's how I roll best. Um, so I spent five years living in Nevada, a state where prostitution has become normalized. And I wanna share with you what that experience is like. One of my very first experiences after moving to Nevada was to be the tourist and go see the sites. And one of the very first sites a newcomer or a tourist is shown are the ranches, the cat houses, the brothels. These brothels sat just a few miles outside of Carson City in a cul-de-sac of sorts just outside the city limits. One right-hand turn off the main highway and there sat several very modest buildings that housed the quote-unquote legal sources of prostitution. It wasn't something similar to our more sugar shack or our ski slopes or the Burlington bike path. It was the brothels. Nevada has an annual Nevada Day Parade that occurs on October 31st every year. It's a huge, amazing parade that stretches literally for hours and is all inclusive of all cultures, including prostitution. Set in the vast expanse of cowboys, horses, and just about every aspect of Western culture you could imagine was a black convertible with the top down. It was driven by what would per be perceived to be a pimp with several colorfully decorated women sitting in the passenger seat and across the back. In a state where prostitution is the norm, having them visible in the community is also. When I first got to Nevada, I took a job at a local department store for easy access until I settled there. I worked there for about a month with a young 18 year old just out of high school, a young girl. Her job was really quite simple, keep the store clean, mind the fitting room, help the customers. About a month after she started the job, she came into work one day and we were chatting. The conversation went like this. I think I'm just gonna go do what my mom does. It's so much easier. So I asked her, well, what does your mom do? And her response was, she works at the ranches. Her mom was a prostitute and this young 18 year old perceived that job to be easier than being a store clerk and was willing to join her mom in selling her body for money. That says stop, am I stopping? Okay. Yeah. Um, I have copies of the rest if you'd like to have it. I would like some clarification, though, on your public hearing notifications. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Um, I also want to clarify that if anyone has uh, written statements that are um, longer than what uh, you can 
Oh, uh, say in, in two minutes, um, th that is all welcome. And actually there's one other question that I have for you. I'm sorry, if you could tell us your name and where you live. It's okay. Okay, thank you. And we will um, get you some clarification about that. We could, should we do that at the end? Okay, yeah, once we'll, yeah, thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Hi, my name is Mike Shively and is this on? Okay. I think so. uh, my name is Mike Shively. I live in Massachusetts, and um, I've been coming up to these meetings since October, whenever the uh, issue of prostitution has been on the table. And uh, I've been a researcher for about 30 years, and for most of it, I've studied these issues, prostitution and sex trafficking, from lots of different angles. Um, there are about 100,000 studies that you could find on prostitution, so it's really easy to go into it and get lost. It's also easy to go into it and pull out whatever you'd like. If you have a conclusion and you just want support for it, it's easy to do that. And that's what happened with your police commission report and the recommendations. They, they took a very, very narrow sliver of the research and the evidence that supported the idea that decriminalizing prostitution is a good idea, and that's what was presented to you. There wasn't anything else. Also, the choice of people that weighed in when were part of the commission, they were handpicked and they were representatives of the industry. So it would be like if this was about clean air uh, you know, regulations and the only people invited in were representatives of the coal industry. Well, that's what you got. You got industry reps who say that they've had a good experience and they're proponents of it. And surprise, surprise, they're saying, wouldn't it be awesome if there were no laws against this? And also, wouldn't it be awesome if there was no taxes, no regulations, no oversight? Sex work is work, except it's unlike any other work because we don't want any regulations at all. So that's, that's what you've been asked to endorse with um, the one recommendation to support decriminalization at the state level and to lose your ordinances. And I wanna correct something else that uh, one of the city councilors made at the last meeting, which is uh, ordinances are not redundant. They are supplemental. Thousands of cities and counties throughout the United States have prostitution ordinances, even though they have laws and they have them for a reason. They didn't start out with them. They instituted them because they needed them. They do things like allow businesses to, that are actually brothels uh, or nuisance properties uh, to get their business license revoked. There are a lot of things that can be done through ordinances that supplement the state law. And it's a little disingenuous for people to say, well, uh, thir 10 yeah, seconds? Yeah, fine? You're, you're fine. Yeah. Okay. We'll um, it's a little soon. disingenuous for the people to say, well, don't worry so much about using these ordinances because we still have the state law, right? This is just a clean up language. When the, when the recommendation right next to it is, and we want to abolish the state law, and we also want the police not to enforce the law we have while we have it. So it's clearly a much broader effort to just decriminalize. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else uh, with us in person wish to make a comment? Okay, um, and so we'll go to folks with us uh, virtually. All right, uh, uh, Caitlin uh, Macias. I'm sorry if I did not say your name correctly. Oh, it's Macias, thank you. Yes. Hi, my name is Caitlin. I am a resident of South Florida, but I'm here representing a World Without Exploitation. We're a national coalition of over 200 national-based anti-trafficking organizations, and we definitely stand in opposition of fully decriminalizing the sex trade. Um, I personally work with young people every day. I run our youth coalition and we have young people all over the country and young people are very susceptible to entering the sex trade. There was someone here that has already stated that um, youth in foster care, youth who are part of the LGBTQ community are particularly vulnerable. And by decriminalizing pimping, brothel owning and sex buying in the state of Vermont, um, you're actually just gonna make um, youth more vulnerable to detectives of traffickers and brothel owners um, to be manipulated with false promises of love, safety, and security. Um, and they'll find themselves unable to uh, escape this kind of exploitation. So we hope that today that you consider the harms to children to marginalized populations in your state. 
Um, and instead of actually fully decriminalizing the sex trade, we uh, at World, we take a holistic approach um, called the equality model, also known as the Nordic model. That's something that's been passed in Sweden and has been very successful. And that is three pronged, which would be to decriminalize people bought and sold. So we don't want people that are um, in prostitution to be criminalized, but we do want to continue to criminalize exploiters like sex buyers, pimps and brothel owners. And the third thing that is super, super important that is often mix, missed is um, exit strategies and services. So the right to exit, getting people mental health care, um, getting people um, the health care that they actually really need. And I see someone actually nodding her head. That's super important because it takes an average of 12 times to actually get someone out of the sex trade and rehabilitated. And as a lot of people have said, there's an extreme amount of violence um, and PTSD that people experience. So decriminalizing those bought and sold, uh, continuing to criminalize exploiters, and then also exit strategies and services. And so we really don't want um, to have Vermont be the first state um, or in this ordinance to decriminalize the sex trade, and we want alternatives to be proposed. Um, I am also a, a student at the Columbia School of Social Work, and so I'm, I'm really in opposition of this. Thank you. Um, Caitlin, can I ask you a follow-up question? Sure, absolutely. Um, what was the name of the alternative uh, proposal uh, uh, set of ideas? You, you had sure. a name for it, and I just I didn't catch, couldn't remember the name. Um, so it's called the Equality Model. Equality Model, also okay. Known at, as the Nordic Model. So it's basically the same thing, but if you Google Equality Model or Nordic Model, um, they're very similar, and it's the same three-pronged approach. Okay, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, Jenna Clark. Hello. Um... I am a Montpelier resident, and I am um, here to just yeah, share with the city council that I would also really love to um, adopt the state law and uh, as our, our city ordinance, which criminalizes prostitution. And I just wanted to share um, that my family um, you know, desires this, but also every other uh, community member that I've spoken to uh, in Montpelier, in Barry City, Barry Town, um, are very surprised that we're even considering this and also um, desire that we criminalize prostitution. Um, thank you. Thanks. Uh, Re Rebecca Zipkin. Um, hello, my name is Rebecca Zipkin. Um, I'm a resident of Connecticut. Um, I'm here as a national anti-trafficking activist. I'm also with um, World Without Exploitation, like Caitlin. Um, I just wanted to add something very briefly to what um, Caitlin said, which is that while we do support changing your local ordinance and not using the archaic language that is included, um, we would love to see the ordinance changed um, to prohibit um, the allowance of exploiters, um, brothels, houses of prostitution, anything like that to pop up in Montpelier. Um, we also really um, want to emphasize that we think the city council is signaling to the state legislature by doing this, that you are in support of repealing criminal laws at the state level, um, and that you are thus in support of legal prostitution. Um, what happens when um, a state repeals laws against the sex trade, against promoting prostitution, third party exploiters and sex buying, is that it then um, becomes decriminalized and people then want to legalize. Um, people want to open brothels legally and you will see Vermont become a hub of sex tourism in this country. Um, so we ask you not to signal to the state legislature that you are in support of legalized prostitution in Vermont. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, anyone else uh, with us virtually that would like to make a comment? Okay, uh, okay uh, Ashley uh, Strubridge, and then I see your hand, uh, Michael Mannion. So uh, we'll we'll go to you after. Go ahead, Ashley. Hi, I um, I I just want to. Uh, this is the first I've actually heard of this, um, and um, yeah, I agree with the two um, folks who are from the um, anti-sex trafficking group, Caitlin 
um, Messiah, is it Messias? Okay. Um, anyway, and uh, and I, I just think, you know, um, providing safety for uh, the victims of sex trafficking and um, anyone who is, uh, you know, selling selling themselves, I guess, is probably the the first step. And then also. Um, you know, but but making sure that the perpetrators, the folks, the folks who are who are creating these victims, are are not getting off scot free. I think, um, I, I think you know, the idea of Vermont and Montpelier becoming a, 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 a sort of a beacon of you know bringing bringing in sex trafficking just sounds. Uh, I can see where it would lead to that, and that just it, that's scary to me. So I just want to you know mention that. Um, but yeah, that's that's what I'd like to say about that. Yeah, thank you. Um, and uh, Michael Mannion, go ahead. I'm sorry if I'm not yeah. saying your name correctly. Yeah, that's fine. Thank you. Um, I just want to say I appreciate all of the hard work that you do on, there at the council. Uh, obviously, you intend to make life better for um, society at large and individuals. Um, but I'm curious about a couple of things. Um, I know you do feasibility studies for a number of different issues, and I wonder what sort of feasibility studies you've done regarding this particular topic. Um, you've had a number of people who have worked very hard uh, professionally in this area, and the evidence that I'm hearing from their testimonies is that decriminalizing prostitution is not a, a good idea for the individuals involved as prostitutes or for society in general. So I'm wondering if you can provide any evidence from people who may have testimonies that uh, would support the idea that decriminalizing prostitution would be a good idea for society in general or for the prostitutes themselves. And I'd be very curious to hear what the the board has uh, or your council there has to to show for that. A another thing that I had think I saw was that one of the reasons that you wanted to do this was to change the priorities so that the police would be able to focus their attention on more serious matters, such as uh, sex trafficking. And I'm wondering if you can explain why focusing on something more serious is not easily accomplished without uh, legalizing uh, the prostitution or decriminalizing it. And so I'd be very interested to know what your uh, response to those questions would be. And thank you. Great, thank you. Um, anyone else with us virtually uh, wish to make a comment? Um, okay, I'm not seeing anyone. Uh, and so I wanna go back to folks uh, in person. Anyone else wish to make a comment? That's here. Okay, uh, yes, go ahead. Oh, sure, go ahead, yep. So I'm not here to argue for or against this action, um, but I think for the clarity of the conversation, there's a few points that might um, help. Uh, because I, I heard some of the comments. Um, first, um, we did a search. There's only one other community that even mentions prost prostitution in any of their city ordinances, and it's in Winooski. It has to do uh, actually in their buildings along with rowdy people, disorderly people, and it mentions prostitution. So folks that spoke here from other Vermont communities, your communities don't have a, a, an ordinance about prostitution. So it's not like this would make Montpelier an outlier or would actually make us consistent with the entire rest of the state. Uh, second thing is the city council has no authority to criminalize or decriminalize um, prostitution or anything else. Any of our ordinances are civil, local ordinance violations. The only people who can have criminal, put criminal statutes in place are the state legislature. This action, um, while it did come from the uh, folks on the police review committee is actually something we've been eyeing for a long time because of the poor, the language. And if anybody reads the actual language that's proposed to be um, 
to be repealed. It says, no female person shall be a prostitute, nor shall apply the vocation of a prostitute, nor shall subject her person to prostitution, and no male person shall associate with such female person for the person of prostitution. I think we can all agree that that language is not very good and should not be in place. And that was really, I think, one of the impetus here. So certainly everybody has their own views, and I'm not a policymaker. I don't have a vote. But I think it is helpful as we have this debate to understand um, really nobody else in Vermont has this kind of ordinance. And second of all, the city council has no authority to criminalize or decriminalize prostitution. Thank you. Do you want to comment about the process for um, public hearings? Yes. yes. So uh, there was a question about public hearings. Um, our, our charter requires one public hearing to change ordinance. We call it a reading. It is advertised with the um, agendas. We, by practice, do two readings um, just because we think it's good process to give people a chance, a couple chances to talk about it. And sometimes an amendment comes out of the first reading, which then is read at the second reading. Uh, so legally, we do one, we have to do one hearing or reading. In practice, we do two. So this is the first of two scheduled hearings or readings. And it, it's um, posted any, anywhere the schedule is yes, it's, posted. It's warned along with the regular meeting agenda. That it, there's no additional warning or reading requirement for ordinance changes than regular meeting notices, with the exception of zoning ordinances, but I won't go into that. Fair enough. OK, thank you. Um, OK, lots of good questions. Um, thoughts, folks? Oh, uh, I guess I will close the public hearing at this point. Yes. Yes. Go ahead, Connor. Yeah, sure. Well, I want to start by thanking everybody to come out. I think everybody has the yes. best of intentions on this issue um, and really appreciate the input. Uh, where I'm coming from, just speaking for myself, uh, I think we have an antiquated ordinance here that has not been invoked, uh, as far as we know, uh, to prosecute trafficking, prosecute rape, or prevent uh, sexual contact with minors. We, we don't use this ordinance. Um, but I think its mere existence could have a problem um, in negatively impacting health and safety of sex workers uh, by criminalizing this act. Um, it, it, it sort of undermines, I think, uh, sex workers' ability to seek justice for crimes against them. Uh, that could include like rape or robbery. It could include like violence from a client. It has a chilling effect, I believe. Um, and if you treat people like criminals, um, they're much less likely uh, to report exploitation of minors, uh, to report instances of trafficking, because they may be afraid of being prosecuted and going to jail themselves. So by taking this out of the shadows, I really believe it is a measure that could help uh, health and safety there. And, uh, you know, I think we really need to make the distinction between decriminalization and legalization. This is not like setting up an Amsterdam type of situation with uh, a bunch of red booths there. But I do appreciate there's conflicting information on both sides and data. And when that's the case, I generally turn to sources I trust. And in this case, that would be the ACLU, Human Rights Watch. Um, I, I've worked with them on a couple of issues over the years there. Um, so that, that's where I'm coming from. Where I would maybe uh, clarify what we did last time is I could see the blanket motion to decriminalize this on the state level um, as being interpreted different ways. And I would be supportive of taking a step back on that until we actually see the legislation being proposed and could kick it to the legislative committee to give it more due diligence. I, I would be amenable to that. But as far as this ordinance, I, I think it's, it's time has come and we do need to repeal it. Uh, Carrie. Yeah, thank you. I um, Just following up a little bit on what Connor just finished with, um, I did vote against the, the motion last time that included uh, advocating for decriminalization on the state level, um, simply because I didn't feel like we had followed the greatest procedure in order to make that kind of decision. And so if we were to reconsider that particular decision, um, I'm, I'm not making any statement about how, uh, whether I would support that or not, but I would prefer to see it go through a more deliberative process in order for us to decide that the city is going to take that position. Donna. Um, 
just a, a little different perspective is that I feel that the police review committee did a huge deep dive into this and they kept us posted and it came out from their group. And I really respect that because a much deeper dive than I've had. But I also feel like that we should strengthen human trafficking laws. But if we're after prostitution, which in our mindset is unfortunately mostly women, I think we're going after people who are the victim, that we're not separating them from the from the from those who are abusing them or coercing them. So I like to see human trafficking get stronger and all the things they are under, including child abuse, and de move this fact of putting it on sometimes, which is the victim or the, or the person who's voluntarily wanting to earn their living that way. Thank you. Yeah, Jack. Thank you. Um, thanks, Donna. I uh, served on the police review commission and uh, we studied this extensively. We had uh, several of our meetings in which it, this topic was discussed and for one thing, as other people have said, it's very clear that nothing we do here in this council will legalize prostitution in Montpelier. Um, second, I think that uh, what, what we saw in the Police Review Commission is that the most important thing that we as a city government can do and what the uh, excellent police department we have can do is to focus on uh, responding to and eradicating uh, abuse, exploitation, and human trafficking. And uh, that is, uh, that's a very high priority. And I think it's uh, in line with uh, the priorities that are operationally in effect for the uh, Montpelier Police Department. We don't see the police department running around town arresting sex workers, but uh, they are responsive to uh, allegations of abuse and exploitation when, when they come in. So I think that the time has come to uh, repeal the ordinances that we have now to talk about what the overall response would be to the uh, to the real issues of abuse, exploitation, and trafficking, and uh, so for that reason, I move that we uh, schedule a second uh, public hearing on on the proposed repeal of this ordinance. Second. Okay, so there's a motion and a second. Um, to have some further discussion about this. Um, I, I want to check in with you, Jennifer, um, with us virtually. Anything you want to um, say about this? And if not, that's okay. Oh, thank you, um, Mayor Watson. Um, I appreciate the interest in our small little state capital from so many people that are out of our little state capital. Um, but I have to say that um, I, I, I don't have a problem stating where I stand. And if we were able to uh, decriminalize sex work, I would vote for that because I've spent 20 years working with sex workers. And I see what FOSTA and SESTA has done for people that are legitimately trying to make a living um, with their bodies as they choose. And it makes it harder for them to be safe. And it takes away a lot of energy from actually working with folks that are being trafficked um, and putting a lot of emphasis on sex workers who are choosing to do this. And I don't wanna split hairs and it's horrible what happens to people when they're being, I mean, I, I get all that, but we have to think about the human beings that are also doing this for choice. And I know that that's not what this ordinance is about. I know that we're just talking about language here but I've heard a lot of conversation these last two meetings regarding this about what's gonna happen if we legal, we can't legalize prostitution. That's not what we're talking about here. And um, I'm also not afraid to say that I would support um, changing things if I had that ability, but I don't. So um, that's where I stand, but I also am with council and I would love to continue this conversation 
um, amongst those of us that have to vote on changing the language. Sorry, Jennifer, if I can um, jump back real quick, you, you cut out for a second, like um, maybe you all heard what- Sorry. Did you, you all, okay. No, 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 that's fine. I My air conditioner's on behind me, so. No, you're good. I, I'm not sure if, if I had heard you correctly. So um, great, thank you. Um, but it sounds like folks did, so that's good. Um, okay. Um, other thoughts folks have? I have two thoughts. Um, so one thought is do, uh, I know we're, we're gonna have a vote on, on, the, uh, on the motion. Um, so one thought is, is there um, energy that folks wanna put into uh, reconsidering the, the part about uh, the legislative agenda? Um, is there anyone who, well, I just want to just check yeah, in about. I mean, I'd, I'd be okay reconsidering that piece okay. um, because I would like to see what the legislation is before we consider it okay. and maybe even advocate for strengthening uh, the trafficking components in some cases. Okay. Uh, but to just, uh, you know, and, and to be very clear, I don't support prosecuting this at the mm -hmm. state level mm -hmm. or the city level, yeah. but I, I like to see what I'm signing on to yeah. with legislation. Um, okay, so that's one thought. Uh, oh, yes, Jack, go ahead. Thank you. I, uh, I know that the mayor and I discussed the question of whether we would uh, have a motion to reconsider the vote that we had at our previous meeting about uh, the overall policy question. And uh, I, I was thinking about doing that. And then unfortunately we've had an intervening meeting uh, with the meeting we scheduled, the special meeting we scheduled to do the uh, set the tax rate. And so at this point, I think it would be out of order to do a motion to reconsider. However, I also think that uh, when the legislative session comes up and the uh, starting to meet to discuss what, what our priorities are, what we're gonna uh, support and what we're going to oppose, I think that it, it would make sense to be looking at all the all the possibilities, including whatever legislation on sex work and sex exploitation is uh, be going to be before the legislature. Just to clarify, is it, it has to be at the next meeting or the next regularly scheduled meeting? Because that was not a regularly scheduled meeting. That's a good question. And I did not bring my copy of Robert's rules with me. Um, <laughs> But that doesn't mean that you can't make a change. To that's the, true. To we the could ordinance. just. I mean, so it's beside the point. I mean, if indeed you wanted to make a motion to modify, then this is the hearing to do it to be presented next time. For a point of clarification, the issue is not amending the ordinance. It's the, the uh, additional the policy statement that went with it, and that that's different. Yeah. Because because this is. Yeah. Changing this ordinance isn't a reconsideration. This is a vote on okay. its first. So they're two separate things. Two separate Bill. things. Yeah. They're two separate things. So they shouldn't even be discussed right now. Right now we're just dealing with the hearing that's on true. the ordinance. True. That's true. I and, okay. That's and, yeah. and the, yeah. the motion to set the hearing was it was all one motion. Yes. No, I think they're, I think we separated them separate because motions. they were separate. Yeah. Oh, in that case, then. But but even if they weren't, we're now talking about the second hearing. So we make a motion dealing with right. the ordinance in the second. Right. Mostly, hearing. I just wanted to check in to see if there was, if we should be discussing that after. Well, I guess we're kind of discussing it now. But we should have a vote on Jack's motion. It, I heard Jack's motion being the ordinance. Yes. Thank you. Right. That is it. Yes. Accurate. Um. I had another question, but I'm going to save it till after this vote. <laughs> um, even while Jack is reading the rules. Um, all right. Um, any further discussion on the setting the hearing for the next reading? Okay. Seeing no discussion. Um, okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed. Okay. Um, so one thought was, do, you know, do we? have any further conversation about uh, 
about the, the policy statement. Another thought is I, I am hearing from folks what sounds like consensus to me about um, and having an emphasis on human trafficking. And uh, it, the last time um, we were talking about this, we had a presentation from the chief uh, who had some thoughts on how uh, there were some, he called them loopholes in the state uh, statute. Maybe we're not done having the conversation about human trafficking if the state statute is. Uh, um, so that's, that's maybe an, another topic that we could take up. Maybe we don't have a prostitution ordinance, but maybe we have a human trafficking ordinance and that um, is a slightly different emphasis and slightly different thing, um, even though they are related. Um, so I realize I'm, I'm talking about two things simultaneously here. So maybe I'll, I'll I just wanna make sure I, I raise that. Um, Jack, are you, are you still um, coming up with an answer here? Here's what I think. Um, and this is uh, section 337 of R Robert's rules. And this is the 10th edition, but I don't think this has changed in the 12th edition, which is the current one. Um, in a session of one day, such as an ordinary meeting of a club or a one day convention, the motion to reconsider can be made only on the same day the vote to be reconsidered was taken. So I think that means that it would have had to be made at the meeting at which we uh, took the vote. Hmm. Uh, now, someone else may have a different opinion about that, but that's what I think okay. the rule is. Fair enough. Uh, Carrie. Uh, that's what my quick Googling came up with as well. So okay. I think it's probably right. All right. Um, there's possibility for a modification if we want to. Um, yes, Donna. I modified that motion not to go to a specific legislation, but that in general, we were interested in pursuing and following up. Mm -hmm. I think Connor or somebody reminded me because I think I quoted the actual motion and we said no, it was just we wanted to make sure that we were paying attention to what they were doing. Just so you all know, it was two separate motions. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, any thoughts on having a motion regarding uh, modifying the policy statement? If not, that's okay. Oh, Jack. I've been reading during part of this, so I'm not sure. <laughs> as I said, when we get to the point of formulating our legislative agenda for the sense to have that be. Okay, and um, yeah, fair enough. And that should probably be what, like November ballpark? When does the legislative? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Comfortable with that. Okay. So we'll revisit it at that point. Okay, uh, great. Any, um, any other thoughts on that? Okay, and um, we do have another, uh, a, a second reading on this. Um, August 24th. Okay, August 24th. Um, any interest in having more conversation about possibility, the possibility of having a human trafficking um, ordinance? Okay, right, just checking. Cool. Um, and something that we can um, uh, just check in with, oh, I'm actually, and Jennifer, you're, okay. Uh, okay, cool. Well, I think that is it then. Um, thoughts, any, any further thoughts on this before we move on? Okay, um, thank you. Um, came out to speak um, on this this evening. Um, and there'll be another reading on this on August 24th. And we'll go from there. Uh, Donna. Could we have our break early? Sure. Today before we get into the next lengthy Well, topic? we could take a break right now. Yeah, okay, cool. thank you. All right, so we'll, uh, it's 8.10 right now. We'll be back at 8.20.
Uh, all right, team, we are going to um, bring it back together here. Uh, we're a, a minute past our our time here. Um, hey, uh, uh, oh, great, awesome. Hello, we're going to we're going to bring it back together here. Uh, OK, so uh, we are going to take up the uh, equity reports update. Um, um, so for this one, am I turning it over to uh, to you, Bill, or Cameron, or who am I turning uh, it over probably to? Probably Cameron or if there, uh, or Shana, if she's on. Oh, is Shana on? She was. She's not able to make it. Oh, oh Jeremy. Jeremy's. Oh, My Jeremy. Here. There he is. But I wonder if Cameron wants to tee things up. Sure. Or not. Hi, so this is unplanned and unrehearsed, so <laughs> I don't have a set thing to tell you, but what I will sort of cue up is that the Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee has done an incredible amount of work in the past uh, fiscal year, really, but beyond that, to bring an equity report to council to take a look and help uh, staff um, take a look at our policies and our internal practices and how we can better accommodate our entire community within everything that we do. And one of, um, you know, one of the products that they're here to talk about today is sort of an update on where they're at within that equity plan. So um, they've recently come to you with their stipend proposal and we have implemented our stipend program. I'm gonna give this a plug in general to the folks who are watching at home or for anybody who is interested Anyone who is currently serving on a city committee is eligible to receive a stipend of $50 per meeting, uh, no questions asked. Anyone who is interested in applying to a committee is also eligible to receive a stipend, no questions asked. And we would really encourage um, everyone to take a look at our website. We have multiple openings and multiple committees right now, and we are looking for um, folks to help us. Um, so. The Social and Economic Justice Advisory Committee would like to just give you guys a general update on the broader equity plan and where we're at and what our next steps are. And I do believe that that is sort of the question at the end of this is what does council want to prioritize as the next steps for our equity plan? So I hope I didn't steal any thunder. Mm -hmm. I will turn it over to Jeremy now. And um, there are other members of the committee here as well. Um, Michael Sherman is here. And I just want to uh, thank them both for their work. Thanks, Cameron. Yeah, so the way we're gonna just kind of quickly do this update is I'm gonna kind of speak more about the general recommendations that um, came out of the work with Creative Discourse. And Michael is gonna touch on more specifically the, the police review um, recommendations. Um, so before I dig into this, I, Cameron is way too kind. <laughs> Um, she serves as our liaison on the, on CJAC, and the updates that I'm making just would not be happening without Cameron's work and, and others, of course, but Cameron is the person we most directly interact with, um, and she is like a fierce champion for these things, so I'm, I'm like really grateful to have Cameron um, working with us on this stuff, so just really want to say that first. Um, so there's the way this is structured, and uh, you have access, I believe, to the written report, so I'm not going to read through that. I'm just going to call out a few of the highlights. Um, but we were kind of structuring this on those recommendations that came out of the creative discourse work. Um, some of those recommendations were generated by creative discourse themselves, and also included were recommendations that were solicited from um, members of the community uh, of Montpelier. And so we have some updates on some of those items as well. Um, first, and kind of a, the most exciting for us right at the moment, I think, is the stipend pilot program, um, which council, um, I think, is pretty aware of. You approved the, the 30000 budget um, to run this pilot. Um, and so we're really just kind of getting into actively recruiting. Um, and we're, we're confident that it's going to you know, improve participation in city government. Um, and we, we do have some metrics established to help us understand how well we're doing with that program as we monitor it over the next year. Um, and that, that was a recommendation that came from Creative Discourse. Another recommendation um, area that we're working on is around language access. 
um, particularly for folks with um, limited English proficiency. Um, the work that's been done is just to identify what the most common languages other than English are spoken. Um, we've uh, reached out to the school district to give us a list of those languages because they're, I think, a little bit ahead of us on kind of tracking that. Um, the city currently does partner with a translation service um, for the police department. Um, other departments can make use of that if needed. Um, we acknowledge that there's more work that needs to be done on this issue. One thing that's currently in process, though, is um, welcoming our kind of new community members from Afghanistan who speak Pashto. Um, and so there's some work um, kind of being done specifically for that, that group of folks who speak Pashto. Um, the next bucket of things um, around equity have to do with just accessibility to city services, um, both kind of digitally, but also in, in uh, physical spaces. Um, there's a, a few things to update on that. Um, so we are in the process of overhauling the city's website. That work began in June. Um, and I think it's at the early stages of kind of content development with each of um, city departments kind of reviewing their content and suggesting new updated content for the website. Um, so that's an ongoing process. Um, I think it'll be a really good improvement for the accessibility of our web services. Um, second, around staff council interactions, um, there was um, the rules of conduct at public meetings um, was passed in May, just to make some, make some clarity around expectations for how city and staff are interacting um, and council interacting um, in, the, in the course of, of public meetings. Um, and then finally, just because of an ongoing note around physical accessibility, the ADA committee continues to meet. And of course, they're prioritizing ADA compliance projects within the city. And that's an ongoing review process um, that is occurring. OK, um, moving on, the next batch of recommendations I'm going to touch on um, really have to do with recommendations that came from the community members themselves and were incorporated into the creative discourse report. Um, I may not touch on all of these that are in the report, but I'm just going to highlight a few. Um, one um, where a lot of work has been done and, and led by Cameron in particular is around conducting anti-racism trainings for staff. Um, a number of trainings have already been completed, um, equity and inclusion work um, with the leadership team. There's a whiteness at work training that's being piloted. Um, and an all staff sensitivity training was held in June of, of this year. Um, so, and Cameron can speak more to those, I'm sure. Um, another accessibility piece that I think has been really important for folks is just keeping the, the remote option for attending city council meetings. Um, and so making them hybrid and that will continue for the foreseeable future. Um, in the category of kind of community relations, um, just note here that the city signed a contract with Capital Area Neighborhood, the CAN Group, in March. Um, and, you know, really the focus of their work is to facilitate the sharing of information from the city to neighborhoods um, through the various representatives in the CAN um, network group. Um, we received in that uh, creative discourse report a number of, um, you know, concerns and recommendations around housing issues. Um, particularly around folks who are experiencing um, ho homelessness in our community. Um, and so there's, there's a long list of things here just in terms of uh, city supporting other organizations who are working on these issues more closely. And so there's a lot of funding opportunities um, whereby the city is, is supporting services that kind of wrap around our community to assist folks who are experiencing homelessness. Um, lots of detail there to read in the actual update report. Um, one other thing I think that was that came out of our work specifically in, in CJAC um, that's been uh, in use ongoing is the bu budget equity assessment tool, which we introduced in November of 2020. Um, and this is a tool to help with um, city departments in their planning processes to make sure they're um, kind of reviewing their budget priorities through an equity lens. Um, that tool has been used in the FY23 planning process and will be used again moving forward. And then the, fi the final update I'll just um, make before I turn it over to Michael um, has to do with um, our kind of diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives in the city. Um, and so the, the update here is that the city has increased staffing numbers for folks who identify as women, gender nonconforming, um, and those who identify as a race other than white. 
Um, so there's been some percentage increases and in, in new city staff in, in all of those areas and the numbers, specific numbers are in the, the equity update report. Um, so I'm gonna stop there and Michael, turn it over to you to touch more specifically on the police um, review committee recommendations. Uh, thank you, Jeremy. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Cameron, for uh, helping us get to this. Uh, I think there are a few things that um, I'll just add to what Jeremy said before I go on to the specifics of the police. Uh, when we, as a committee, were discussing or trying to figure out what what's going on and where these are, we created a three-part way of analyzing it. There are three categories. One is operational. The second one is relational and the third is structural. So as you think about these suggestions and, and where we're headed, they, they, most of them fit into at least one and some of, the, some of them into two of these general categories. Uh, so the, 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 there were four recommendations that came out of our committee, uh, that out of our report. And I, I want to emphasize one thing and that is that many of the proposals that you've been listening to uh, in the police chief's presentations over the past few months are a combination of recommendations that came from the CJAC report and the police committee report. Um, I served on both of those as, uh, and uh, I, it, sometimes we, we have to be careful to separate which, which belongs to which. And, um, in, the, in every case, there is, there's some overlap. I mean, we didn't contradict each other in, in anything that I can tell, but uh, the, the, the police committee reports went into more detail on different, different specific activities, whereas the report from the, the consultants that you, you read uh, had only four general areas of, of, of uh, recommendations. At all. And I think you've seen uh, this doc, this document, this, it's a seven page document, which is a summary of the, the CJAC um, commission, committee report. The first one for policing was create a, a restorative process that can be implemented after a use of force incident that causes community harm. And that's one that we labeled as structural, but I think it's also relational. This is ongoing, as you doubtless know, having listened to the chief's re reports when he comes to the council. Uh, but uh, it's clear that there are, the, the, the police department is moving forward on this. Uh, they have made uh, efforts to partner with the, the city community justice center to hold open plat uh, public platforms um, after significant events. Uh, to, to hear feedback, field questions, and lead with community heal, heal, healing. Um, and that will continue to go, to go on. And I think that there will be more opportunities for the police department to work with the, uh, the community justice center. The second is to clarify roles and expectations of law enforcement officers in the greater vision for public safety and city management and city engagement process. This is clearly a relational uh, issue. Um, the, there are, there are um, ongoing conversations and, and the chief has come back to you at several points at this, uh, several times at this, since this was, report was released to let you know where some of those are, are going. Um, and uh, again, he, he's mostly responding to specific recommendations, but it, it's just simply important to know that uh, th this, this is a high priority issue for the police department and uh, clarifying its vision and clarifying the, both the, the limitations and the, and the, the necessities for uh, pro processes and procedures at the police department. Um, are, under, uh, are being scrutinized carefully, I think. The third is to strive for maximum transparency. Uh, there's a lot of information now that is actually happening. Uh, the first most important one, I think, is the, uh, the proposal and now the implementation of a city body-worn camera uh, um, procedure and policy. Um, and those will contribute to, clearly contribute to transparency. They, 
I think we were all all warned while we were going through this that you, we shouldn't think of the body worn cameras as necessarily preventive um, measures. They're, they're not going to stop crime, and they're not necessarily going to uh, or or po police ac police actions which may be questionable. But they will certainly put a break on it, and they will certainly make it easier to dis to discover and evaluate how events unfold in any particular in, in, in arrests or stops or if things get really out of hand. So, uh, and that's the first part. There are um, a number of other um, things that the police department has done so far. They, can, they are con continuing to release arrest information on social media platforms uh, under the title Community Awareness Policies. Um, they are working on releasing monthly arrest and traffic stop data on the social media platforms and the city's web page once that web page has been upgraded and made available. And they're working with the Valcor, which is the records management system uh, on a public dashboard. That, that's a very complicated system. It, it has had its critics over the years, uh, but it is one that is generally used. And so the police department is, for the time being is sticking with it. Uh, but they are also uh, making every effort to make the information accessible, uh, certainly available and accessible to, on the dashboard. And that will be um, uh, also put up on the city's webpage. The fourth area was what we called relational. And this one was a very complicated one because in our interviews with, with people and our uh, both members of the committee itself and the, the um, consultants that we just uh, hired, they came up with some contradictory or conflicting uh, attitudes about what they want for, out of police. Some were saying they want more police presence. Some were saying they want less police presence. Um, there, there is, you know, there's some effort to sort of get the police out of the cars. Some more effort, to, some effort on the other side is to keep the police running around the city and, 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 and pol policing the whole city, not just downtown. So it is a matter really of trying to moderate and not and moderate, not and ameliorate the, the, the city citizens contact with police. So uh, one of the main uh, ways in which this is done is cities, uh, the police department has made a much closer alliance with the capital area neighborhood, the CAN networks. Uh, and to to uh, I know that the chief has had um, has attended some of the can meetings around the city, um, and then the city is also uh, putting together a crisis intervention pro team program that will bring uh, people who are special have special tra training and experience dealing with. Uh, drug abuse with uh, mental health issues uh, onto the scene uh, as quickly as possible to work with the police instead of uh, keeping those in, se in separate buckets. Um, and the mo most visible, I think, effort in this re respect has been the community resource officer uh, who is a, a, it's a new position and uh, is uh, uh, you, you the police the police officer turns up at the city at the farmers market is working with community groups um, is out on the street uh, and those are and uh, there's more of an effort to make the police um, uh, a part of you know the scene in the in the commit in the community um, there's also a uh, uh, the creation of the the GERT, which is uh, graffiti, um, a community-led graffiti removal team. So there's some some work in every one of the the four areas that we uh, identified, and it, obviously it's ongoing and uh, it's a long list of things that we presented to the the police chief, both through the CJAC report and the police committee report. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Anything um, you if I could, if I could yeah. just maybe kind of fine tune our request um, that Cameron kind of prefaced, um, there are many, many potential issues that CJET could be working on 
Um, we've started a, a kind of prioritization tool where we're tracking each of the items that we just presented to you, as well as others that are coming up. Um, and you know, it's it's a list of you know dozens of things. Um, I think what would be helpful from you all over the coming months and as you get into strategic planning processes um, is you know yeah, having a sense of what your priorities are as city council um, around equity issues um, and and so that we can understand how we can be a, a really supportive resource um, in our function on the committee um, to really advance the issues that are really important um, to you all council but also the larger community um, so that's that's one of the things we'd be looking to hear from you about over the you know the coming weeks and months as you start looking at planning for the, the following year thanks yeah thank you um i I just want to start by saying, I mean, I think this framework is really helpful and it's really nice to be able to uh, piece together like what the different initiatives are and uh, what they're about and sort of where we're at. So I appreciate that you all are doing this work to track where we're at with each of these um, particular initiatives. Um, you know, in thinking about where we go next, I'm so the next time that we do strategic planning, um, I assume we would do that because we started doing that um, ahead of the budget cycle. And so we would do that in, in October. Um, and so is that timeline, you know, if we, if we took that up then, I mean, I, I think I, one thing I could picture is, you know, having just gone through all this, you know, it's, it's, it's in our, uh, you know, it's in our, on our, all these things are on our radar now. Um, and so as we go through the strategic plan, process, we could see which of these things sort of floats to the top as a, as a priority. Um, if we took that up in October, is that soon enough for you? Or would you like us <laughs> to, um, you know, be thinking about that, any of this sooner? I mean, I'll, I'll maybe Cameron and Michael want to weigh on this. I think, um, you know, if there are thoughts you have prior to October, we'd love to hear about that. Um, I think, we have there is some question about where we should turn our attention to now that you know we're kind of got this, the stipend program up and running and we're looking to just kind of recruit folks and make folks aware of it. Um, I think that the strategic planning process is an important moment though because it's it's aligning priorities so that we're all kind of working in concert and collaboration in the same direction. Um, so it, it may be that there's not a whole lot of direction until that time, um, which I think is fine. I think. We're also, as a committee, happy to be a part of that conversation and helping kind of understand the strategic priorities for the following year based on what we know from our position in CJAC. Um, so yeah, we're we're here and, and able to be a support. I don't know, Michael or Cameron, if you have any other thoughts about that. Um. If I can jump in here, I, I want to certainly give uh, folks in the council an opportunity to jump in, have some other thoughts on how we can proceed, but other thoughts from the council, if not, that's okay. okay. Um, Jack. Thanks, I have a couple of thoughts. Um, thanks for this report. I think it, uh, it, it shows very well the kinds of things the city has been working on and I appreciate the work that the members of the committee have done. Um, one of the things that is sort of related to the uh, to the stipend program is something that I think could be very useful is for us to look at what kind of uh, outreach and recruitment we do for uh, boards and commissions. And, uh, and that's something that, that you know, I've sort of had in the back of my head to work on uh, since even before I got on the council. And that's something that uh, I'd be interested in, in discussing. Um, another thing that is a big deal for a lot of people is the, the quality, which I know we're working on, the quality of city communications and the web page. And uh, it's really hard for even people like me who are on the city's webpage all the time to find things I'm looking for. And so I think it must be very difficult for members of the community. So I'm, I'm hoping that we, uh, we do a lot better than we are now in, in the coming, uh, coming year or two. 
Yeah. Um, so a couple of thoughts, unless there's more thoughts here. So uh, a couple of thoughts. One, one thing that I think my, oh, uh, Michael, go ahead. I just gonna say in response to Jack's comment about recruiting, um, the CJAC has taken a lot of responsibility for putting the, the stipend program together with help, of course, for, and with uh, uh, council giving us the money. Um, but also we're doing a lot of publicity and it's, it's a way of recruiting people uh, is just by announcing that there's you know a stipend available and the there's a release that has gone out to uh, Front Porch Forum, I think just about every day for the last month or so. Uh, we're placing it in, uh, in letters to the editor, to the newspapers. Um, each of us is taking turns posting it on Front Porch Forum and you know making connect. So it, the stipend itself calls attention to the need and the invitation for more people to consider being involved in city government. And it, the, the idea of it, as you recall, was to try to get a, a wider range of social and, 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 and racial and ethnic groups uh, and involved in city government. So that's, the, that's where our effort in recruiting money, in recruiting people with money <laughs> to, uh, to, to spread the word about the, the availability of these opportunities. I just have a couple of thoughts, um, and then I want to go to you, Peter Kelman. Um, so one one thought, uh, Michael and Jeremy. One possibility is that as we get uh, closer to our strategic planning session, if there are priorities that you're that that CJAC thinks ought to rise to the top, we would certainly be interested in hearing that. Um, I, I think um, so. You know, especially you know, con considering all these metrics, like what would be the easiest thing to do versus what would have the most impact. You know, th that's the kind of um, discussion that I, I think you all might be able to have and um, bring the results of that to us, and that would be really helpful. Um, and I guess my my second thought is just in the absence of any other suggestion, um, you know, the fact that we have a communications coordinator now and there's some suggestions here regarding our website, it feels like there might be some um, opportunity there to, uh, I, like, I, I don't know where we are with the website, but if it makes sense to um, have those conversations. Fair enough, fair enough. So at least to start those conversations around how the website can be more accessible um, and potentially, uh, have different documents available in different languages, you know, that, you know all the, the digital kinds of communication. That feels like might be a place to start, but if you had other suggestions that you wanted to bring to us, that would be fine too. Um, and Peter Kelman, go ahead. Uh, Peter Kelman, uh, Montpelier. Um, I, I was initially a member of CJAC in its, when it began, and it's very exciting to see uh, these kinds of uh, results coming out. I'd just like to comment on a couple of them uh, uh, because I think uh, we always have our best intentions, but it's very important to see whether we get best results. And so the metrics of measuring our results, I think are gonna be cr critical. Um, uh, Jack pointed out uh, the importance of recruiting. And yes, uh, there's been lots of stuff on Front Porch Forum about the $50 stipend, but has this actually been a part of recruiting for openings? Um, I, I know that I helped to recruit for the new housing committee and I mentioned it, but I didn't see much, I haven't seen much use of that in recruiting. In fact, I haven't seen much recruiting aside from posting it on the website. So that's the second point. The website needs more than content fixes. The website needs a complete remake. Um, and it's not just a technical fix. It's also a staffing fix. If you don't have a webmaster through whom all information goes in to make sure that information is consistent across pages, et cetera, et cetera. I, I don't wanna give a lecture on this, but I was in the business for a long time. This website, needs investment. So when you guys are making your 
your uh, budgets up next year. I, and I said this at the last budget, you haven't put enough money into the budget to make a real professional website that will work for uh, everybody. But there's also, you can't rely on technology. There are many people in this town who are older folks who don't have access, who can't be reached in that way or can't be reached satisfactorily in that way. And that's the reason why CAN is so important. And I would urge you to not only continue the relationship with CAN, but to strengthen it by work, having the city councilors work as the city councilors from District 3 have with CAN to reach out into the, uh, the, the neighborhoods. But also, um, I know that it's begin there's beginning to be work with the various committees and with various departments, but it's, it's really just scratching the surface. Um, and I think we have to recognize that we're in the 21st century. We no longer have the Times Argus coming out every day. We no longer have WDEV as a radio station that we can all tune into in the morning. We know many of us no longer go to churches and, and civic organizations. We, but we can't let social media be the replacement. Social media has a role to play, but human contact, we've seen the frustration boil over on Front Porch Forum. We've seen the frustration boil over at city council meetings. And it's frustration by people who feel that they're not being heard it's, or that their issues are, the issues that we, they wanna talk about aren't being dealt with, that they're not getting a response. There needs to be more back and forth response. And I think it's gotta be done in a human way. Look, I appreciate Bill and Ann writing on the bridge, the message from city hall, but how many people read that? How many people really read that? There's gotta be, we've gotta figure out ways to get personal. So I applaud what's been done. You got a lot more to do. And I think the council has an opportunity to really support this work. And I, I, hope, I hope you will do so, but I hope you'll really hold, hold yourselves accountable for results, not just for actions. Actions that don't produce results aren't worth much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, any other thoughts uh, here, team, on uh, this? OK. All right. Um, well, thank you. Uh, Michael, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted to say uh, about, uh, well, no results yet on the stipends because it just went into effect on July 1st. So you know, it's going to take a while. We did do a preliminary survey of what with all the committees to um, allow, first of all, to sort of get the population and allow the, the chairs of those committees to uh, circulate information about it uh, to the, their members. Um, and so we have, a, kind of, we have a, a base, something of a baseline to see what, what the population uh, is, is like of the city committees and how many of them would be who are already on committees would take advantage of the stipend offer. And as Cameron pointed out, no, no questions are asked. Uh, there's no, there's a very easy form to fill out. It's not invasive form. We tried very hard not to, uh, you know, make it, make it formidable or difficult. And we'll see. But uh, it's now just a couple of weeks old. So wait a little bit. Fair enough. Uh, well, thank you, uh, uh, Michael and Jeremy, for your work. Please pass along our gratitude to all of CJAC for, for this work. Um, it's excellent, and we look forward to um, hearing more from you all. Do you feel like you have enough clarity from us uh, moving forward? Yeah, I think so. I think um, it's something we can take to the committee and, and discuss, um, and we can let you know if we need anything else. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. All right. So we are up to item eight, district heat rates. Um, so yeah, great. Welcome. <laughs> um, I do have um, a brief presentation. Everybody can hear me okay? You could get a little closer to the mic, maybe. A little, little closer? Yeah. Is that better? Yes. Okay. It is. Much you. better. Okay. Thank you. 
Um, so I'm just going to get started here with that. And then we'll go from there. Oh, no worries. And just hit share. And then thank you. Thank you. Okay. I think everybody can see this, I hope. So I will be quick. Um, so just to take us back uh, to what we're talking about here, we're talking about district heat rates. Um, at the last council meeting, we did set the budget. Um, and so I'm just gonna go over sort of a, a brief outline of what I intend to cover in this presentation. Um, so for starters, I'm just gonna start with um, what's included in the rates, um, then move on to the annual overall performance based on the audited financials. Um, then from there, a quick budget summary pulled from uh, details provided at the last meeting, then on to the rate setting sequencing and why we're doing this the way we're doing it. Um, and then on to proposed rates and then the impacts therein. Um, and so without further ado, I'm gonna get started. Um, so here we've got outlined based on the customer agreements, the two sides of the rate equation, uh, the capacity side, which is the fixed side and the cost of running the system, and then the energy side, which is um, energy based and based on consumption. And so um, wanting to just underscore those things um, as we move on, the, the most impactful piece here, I think that you'll kind of see as we get on in the slides is the capacity side of the equation. Um, the energy side is also um, up for sure, um, but we don't have as much by way of the, the customer impact because we don't know that yet based on their consumption. So moving on to this next slide, this just shows based on the audited financials, I'm gonna to try to minimize. Oh, oh, I'm just gonna go with it. Um, based on the audited financials here, you can see year over year, this goes through 2021. Um, we are auditing 2022 right now. We won't have final numbers until August, um, but you can kind of see where we're ending the year. Um, each year um, we are ending at a net loss and that's just what this identifies. Um, this also includes depreciation, which the budget um, does not uh, for you know best practice for budget. It's either debt service or depreciation. We include debt service in the budgeting. So moving on to this next slide, this is the debt service associated um, with the district heat system and um, you know what, what it took to build the system. Um, and what I really wanna point your attention to is that in 2021, it's about $200,000 in debt service, which is about a third of the budget. And so I just wanna highlight that for you in terms of some of the fixed costs that we can't uh, change. And so here we've got a slide from the budget detail that was provided at the last meeting. Um, so just some key points here. Um, we've got the 689,620. That's an up over FY23 of approximately $63,000. Um, one of the points that I wanna highlight here is that um, we were given two options from the state and I'll get into the sequencing piece of the discussion in a minute but we were given two options from the state uh, to set rates on a traditional methodology, which was just averaging um, costs over three years or looking at the impact of energy um, on the system. And so we chose to go with the higher of those two rates to be conservative and build in uh, what the state was projecting for that forecast. And so that's what's reflected here. Um, in the pie chart, uh, you can kind of see what's included within the budget at a higher level roll up. Um, the other cost that is debt service, just to point that out. Um, and so now on into the capacity and energy side um, and what we're really looking at. Oh. Yes, yep. Uh, so this is adjusted for what they think energy rates will do. 
So based on the energy market, so not necessarily inflation. Okay, so it's not like normalized core inflation. No. Okay. Just noticing they're like, oh yeah, it's kind of an upward trend, but so is inflation. So. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. That's it. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Um, so just uh, uh, what we're going to talk about next are the rates in the next slides and what we're, we're proposing um, going forward. Um, and so I'll just bring them up here. Um, and so this is what the rates will look like if they're approved. Um, and so I talked a little bit about the sequencing. Typically what happens is we get um, detail from the state on what it costs to run the system at the state level. That really helps inform our budget. Um, and so that's what we set the budget on. Um, and then from here, we need to assess um, the amount of money that we need to yield um, for our budget. And so that's where our rates come in. And that's where we've got the capacity rate um, here at uh, 685 up from 625 and the energy rate um, of 1547 up from 1240. Um, it's been quite some time since we've increased our rates. Um, the last time we did so was in 2019. Um, and prior to that, it was 2017. And when we did increase those rates, we were seeing kind of a similar jump or increase. Um, we did not opt to increase rates previously just because of what energy uh, was doing. Um, but now that things are going up, um, it's really important to make sure that we're catching those rates up um, to fund the operation, um, but also to be reflective of what we're seeing and what we're gonna see pass through from the state. Um, and so that's um, what's represented here. Um, and so just looking at my notes here, make sure I didn't miss anything. Um, but you know, ideally what we're really trying to do is you know, set things up so that it can be a little bit more incremental um, and looking at things more year over year rather than and big chunks of time because it really, does um, inflate what we're looking here at here because I don't want to minimize the increase of 60 cents on the capacity side and you know over three dollars on the energy rate. However, it's been kind of a long time coming. Um, and the other thing that I do want to note is we did run sort of the aggregate all-in cost on the system um, per, per gallon, and it's 593. Um, and so that takes the total budget. And we run um, some calculations to convert that um, into BTUs so that then we can um, really assess that cost. Um, we also look at the efficiency of the system. We used an 84% calculation, which um, we received from our consultants. Um, and so we feel like this is a pretty good gauge of you know, what it costs um, if you were to put it on a, a gallon of fuel equivalent. Um, and then just for, you know, just so it hangs together, the cash price of, of fuel for right now is 545. So um, pretty good, um, generally. Um, and then, you know, the other thing that um, these rates are reflective of is the study that Evergreen Energy did for us for capacity and the allocation of the use of um, the system across the user base. Um, and so that impact is represented here. Um, and so you can kind of see where things come out on a monthly basis for the users. We did meet um, with the end user group on Monday to brief them on what this would look like for them. Um, and so you can see the impact of these changes. We do intend to do this for the next heating season, just so that we can really um, take a look at things, you know, see how things are going, um, and, you know, move on from there. Um, and our intent is to really come in compliance with the user agreements and the contracts. Um, and so with that, that is my presentation. I can go back to any of the slides or exit my share or take questions. Um, but what I'm really looking for is, um, for you to approve the rates based on the budget. Jack. Thanks, Kelly. Could we could we go back to the uh, the slide that you showed that showed uh, the uh, year end balances for each of the years? Yes. That's it. I think. Yeah. Um, now, I I'm going to ask what may sound like a stupid question, and I hope hope it isn't. But uh, if it is, so be it. Um, you know, I supported doing the district uh, heat plan when uh, when it was proposed, although I wasn't on the council, um, was the design to uh, 
be have it be a revenue loser at the time it was created or was it designed to uh, meet uh, to cover the expenses of the uh, of the service um, uh, I'll answer that <laughs> thank you Bill um, it was not intended to, to be a revenue loser and one of the difficult things here is if you notice that line um, that says depreciation and you've got you know 325,000 this year if you go I think it's on your next page in the budget that number is actually the debt payment which is 196,000 so on a cash basis it's actually pretty close um, some years it's actually come out in a positive and um, but we're for, we're required to show the, the depreciation. Um, we would like it to be even more cash positive. And we, that really would come from, uh, you know, as Kelly mentioned, most of the costs are pretty fixed. There's not much we can do to reduce the costs. We're working with the state on that aspect of it. Um, and we are working actively and trying a few angles to get some new users, which is really what we need, some additional revenue sources. Um, so. Thanks, and I recognize that there are elect, uh, there were environmental benefits that we as well. that were the driver for this, and so I don't want to no, say we're it was doing never meant to be stupid. a cash loser either. Okay, um, and uh, with the with the meeting with the customers, are you and you you told them what you're planning to uh, to they propose saw slides? Yeah, are um, are, are you getting a sense that there's anyone who's saying, well, I can't afford to pay these rent rates. I'm going to go back to uh, my oil provider or some other source because this isn't, uh, I, I can't cover these costs. Obviously, fuel oil costs are high now too, but it sounds like there's a gap between what someone could pay for heat for fuel oil as opposed to our system. So again, I'll jump. I'll jump in. Um, the we are hearing concerns about the cost, and we've talked to them. I think um, he, so. We've we've spent a lot of time this year working with the customers to build a, a communication information stream. So they've they've seen how we do calculate the capacities. They understand how the budget works. Um, they're in twenty year contracts, so they really can't switch out right now. Um, I think. The question on everyone's mind is, you know, how can we have this positioned in 13 years so that people will want to renew and to stay with the program? And uh, and everyone understands that. And oh, you know, I, I don't see users here, uh, you know, objecting like they they were. I think last year when we did this because they were caught by surprise. I think we've been very active in keeping them informed. They knew we did the Evergreen study. They saw the results of it. We sent this out. We've had quarterly user meetings. We've committed to them that we're going to, you know, work with them. Kurt does a huge amount of work. Kurt and, and the DPW team helping them make their buildings more efficient to bring their capacities down. Uh, and so, um, so I, I wouldn't say people are excited about paying higher rates, but I think they see a path forward. And they also, um, you know, some more than others put a lot of value on the, the environmental benefit. I think particularly the, some of the nonprofits and social groups, I think some of the business owners are kind of like, I could get this for less, but uh, we're getting there. Thanks. I, I think it's, I'm, I'm struck by the uh, parallel to the uh, water and sewer rates that we were talking about recently, where, you know, if we let something, let it go for, four or five or six years or three years. And then, you know, they, they like having not, not having an increase for a few years in a row, but then they don't like getting hit with a big increase when it happens. So the idea of have that, that you've already put in place of having it audited every year. And uh, presumably that will go along with a uh, more regular uh, pattern of increases. We, we hope so. And we hope it will stabilize, you know, we're hoping that by doing the capacity study three straight years that people that by then that will stabilize as well that won't jump around as much but the other the other point of that and just to, to the city's defense or whatever is that um for a number of those years oil prices were really low and so these numbers were drastically different right now it's not 
too different. So for us to raise rates at that point, even though maybe it called for it, was I think even even more difficult. Yeah. So. Um, okay. Thanks. Other questions? Okay. I guess um, I asked everything. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're welcome. Um, I, I guess I do have one follow up question, which is related to the per MMBTU cost. Um, I just want to make sure that I'm clear on this. So, you know, for, for a while, oil was cheaper per MMBTU. Where are we at with that now? It's like, it's close, isn't it? Isn't that, it's, I it's think you're right. Very That's close, yes. It, they're not, it's it's still, still cheaper. it's still cheaper, so but not, yeah. right? It was like 545 versus mm -hmm. 593. Okay, yep. I just wanna make sure that was clear on that. Yes. Okay. And that's all in. So that's the full cost of the system. It's not necessarily just the fuel per gallon. So when you consider the system cost of maintaining your system of a boiler of, you know, all that goes into it, that may, you know, factor into that, you know, so the 545 could potentially be more if more, you consider yeah. those things. But I think generally on a per gallon basis, you know, oil is still yeah a little bit lower. A little bit. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, and I think we need a motion. I move the, we approve the proposed rates. Second. Further discussion? Okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 I just like to really Thank commend you. the work Kelly's done on the financial and her finance team, uh, Todd Preventure and others, to really dig into the numbers behind District Heat and Kurt uh, Modica and Eric Ladd at DPW have really, you know, they needed a District Heat system like they needed a hole in the head and they've taken it on like champs and uh, are really watching over it and working with customers and um, have really um, done a great job with it. So I'm since Kurt's here, I want to be sure to thank both of you publicly because we've come a long, a long way because of the efforts of your teams. Yes, I agree. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And so uh, at this point, we'll take up the uh, holdover from the consent agenda, which was about the stormwater utility. And I'm hoping that the, <laughs> I think I just had a misunderstanding. And so hopefully this is very short. Calm down. <laughs> Monica, this is your life. <laughs> Monica, Deputy Director of Public Works. Um, so I want to just start by saying there is a, a very urgent need for a stormwater utility for funding of uh, infrastructure first, but also for um, some of the environmental benefits that the council is interested in. Um, so we've done two storm projects recently, and uh, those two pipes, um, you could literally just put your finger through the pipe. So um, all, all the infrastructure, storm infrastructure installed in the 70s and 80s is primarily uh, made of metal, and in Vermont we use a lot of salt. So um, we're seeing a high rate of failure in our storm pipes. So the um, I guess I, the point is, um, I don't want to hold this up. I'm hoping that I, um, with what I tell you here shortly, that um, convince council to approve the contract so we can move this forward. I could just ask like one question, then yep. I, and then I'm good. Um, <laughs> okay. Which is that there are there going to be more opportunities for the public to have input? Yes, absolutely. So okay, um, that, that's it. <laughs> yep. so, okay, great. And, <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Very, very detailed. Okay. Yeah. So we're on the we're on the agenda for September for a stormwater utility update. Okay. So we hope to have some numbers with the consultant. We need um, some work by the consultant to be able to really inform council of what this means. Um, so we do we plan to do that work and come back to council give an update. And there's also the committee meetings are open to the public. And uh, once we get to ordinance changes, there'll be obviously public hearings associated with that if council moves forward. So. Okay. Thank you. Great. Um, is there a motion? Regarding, I think it was item H. I'll make a motion. Oh, the language. I'll make a motion that we accept the stormwater utility contract as presented. Second. Okay. Further discussion. Uh, okay. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. I see you there online. Awesome. So it's unanimous. And uh, okay, so that passes. Thank you. Sorry to make you wait. <laughs> All right. We were counting on the fact that you were going to be here for District Heat. Yeah, maybe I was just <laughs> wrong about that. I apologize.
Okay, uh, so we are now up to a discussion about the uh, Elks Club and uh, including a, a hub uh, lease request. So I know there are folks from the hub here, so I would uh, invite you up um, unless there's anything you want to say about well, this. I, first. I will just, yeah, okay. I have a, one of the things that we had committed to uh, was to put monthly uh, an update on what was happening with the Elks Club, uh, how much or little it happened to be. And hopefully it will, you know, it will be more in the future. So the only update that I have, um, we've already told you, is that we have in fact purchased the property, closed on it, so we are the happy owners, and that the uh, request for proposals for the project manager consultant is out. So we're expecting, um, hoping for responses and technically tar te tentatively targeting the next meeting for us to award that. So then a lot, then the, these reports might get longer. But for now, it's just we own it. And the RFP is out. And then we've had, um, I think, a couple of conversations with a, a couple and a few conversations with members of the hub who are interested in doing some things. And um, I felt certainly that it was probably some of these were policy decisions, not administrative decisions about how you wanted to proceed in light of where we were. So uh, we invited them to make their presentation and update you all on what they're doing and what their ask is of the council. Great. So with that, I will turn it over to the August body, body that is the hub. <laughs> oh, okay. Once you get set up, we won't give the list to the website. Thanks. Um, my name is Ethan Atkin. I'm the board chair of the hub and um, we have some, uh, we have a request that we'd like to make to the city council as a follow up to the resolution that uh, the council passed on November 17th, uh, 2021, uh, that authorized the city administration to explore the possibility of uh, building the long envisioned new municipal indoor recreation facility at the former Elks Club property and to explore a public-private nonprofit partnership with the hub to create a recreational complex. So that's what we're here for. And as a real quick uh, update or reminder of what is the hub, I'm not sure how easy it is to read what's on the screen, but uh, basically uh, our mission, it, we're a nonprofit organization and our mission is to provide a safe, vibrant, equitable and inclusive space for leisure activities and recreational programs to enhance and promote the social and physical well being of the community. It's a little long winded, but that's our mission. And um, uh, quickly, we're a volunteer board of directors. We're made up of residents of Montpelier and surrounding communities. Uh, we, our vision is to create a year round membership based social and recreation center uh, to serve. Uh, all members of the community, uh, but particularly there's a great need for places for families to go that are safe and would allow all the members of uh, the family to choose something that they want to do. Um, and we feel that that's what uh, the hub will eventually create. Um, and we, uh, we're, we plan to have a very uh, vibrant um, center that we expect will become a lasting legacy in the city of Montpelier and something that will attract uh, families and businesses to the community. So we, we feel we're doing a public service and we feel uh, the council made a good decision to ask us to work with the city administration to try to create a partnership that would uh, have a synergy that would be greater than the sum of its parts. So uh, what have we done since uh, November uh, 17th? Uh, we had a, a number of meetings with a variety of staff at the city administration uh, to discuss what are the recreational needs. We looked at the data that had been uh, accumulated by the city um, about what people identified as their recreational needs and um, we've jointly identified the overall concepts of which entity, the city or the hub, 
would be responsible for the creation, operation, and maintenance of each of the activities that were identified as uh, needed in the community, uh, both indoor and outdoor. Um, and we are now at a point where the hub is ready to move forward with the components that um, we would agree to, or that we, we agreed to, um, and we hope and expect uh, to work very closely with the city to realize uh, this partnership um, in the long run. We understand that the city is not ready yet to uh, move forward with the, the recreational component, what th they're doing, but we are ready and we feel that um, it's, a, it's a good time for us to begin doing that. Um, so I'm just going to read a few things about where are we, where are we right now. Um, in March uh, 2022, as you all know, the public passed a bond authorizing the city of Montpelier to purchase the former Elks Club property to be used for recreation, housing, and open space. At the time that the bond was announced, the hub was about to complete negotiations with the previous owners of the property, uh, of the property to take out a long-term lease uh, to put up uh, a land lease to put up our buildings and our outdoor recreational facilities and a, a lease of part of the existing building that's on the property to be used for an indoor social center and uh, indoor recreational activities. Um, but that was obviously uh, put on hold when the bond was put on the, the market uh, on the uh, on the uh, ballot and um, that lease was never signed, but we were ready to, to do that. Um, right now, as you all know, the city is under, undergoing uh, a public planning process to identify the most appropriate places on the property for each of the three intended uses, uh, the recreation, the housing, and the open space. And it, it's expected that this process will take 18 to 24 months. Uh, we on the board are very supportive of this process, uh, the public input process, and we fully support it. And uh, we think it's an important thing to do. Uh, and, but at the same time, we understand that once the locations are identified, um, these three components of what will happen on the property can move on different timetables. And we also understand that the recreational component is the component that is most likely to be able to move forward more quickly than the other components, particularly the housing uh, component is obviously going to take more time because there's infrastructure and all kinds of other uh, things that need to be done before the housing can get underway. Um, so we're requesting the city council uh, to authorize the administration to negotiate a memorandum of understanding with the hub uh, that would help us to have the certainty that we need to be able to move forward with what, uh, what we're hoping to do, both as the hub and as part of the partnership. Um, so, um, and we feel that waiting for the projected 18 to possibly 24 months for the whole planning process to be completed uh, would jeopardize our plans and jeopardize the possibility of uh, the partnership as a result. Um, so, uh, we're not asking the city council to um, go into the details of what that memorandum of understanding would be, but there are three components that we feel would be important. And we, we hope that that could be included in uh, the council resolution to the administration uh, to negotiate this memorandum of understanding. And the three uh, uh, things that we're interested in so I, I just do want to take a step back and just say that we're not coming to this, uh, to the council asking for something because we heard that the city has just bought a big piece of property and we, we want a piece of it. We, we're coming in 
uh, we're making an investment in the community. We're going to be putting over $3 million into our component of the project. And um, we're, we're um, ex really excited about the possibility of doing this partnership where we create a, 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 a complete uh, recreation complex that would be sort of a, a crown jewel of the city. Um, and we also are coming uh, to you because we've been involved in this, um, in both the discussions with the city and in the discussions with the previous landowner that would have uh, enabled us to move forward uh, as, as soon as possible. And so we're, uh, the request we're, we're asking for here is not like we're coming from somewhere outside and suddenly uh, asking for something. It's, uh, we're actually coming and saying we're ready to move forward and we're just, we just need the, the ability to do that. Um, so uh, the, three, the three components that we feel would be important in the memorandum of understanding along with anything else that comes up, but one is that we feel we, uh, we would like to be designated as a stakeholder in the planning process, uh, particularly or, or actually exclusively related to the recreation part of it. Uh, and in other words, we're not, uh, we feel that we, we have a, a bigger stake in this than just uh, any other organization that might want to use the land for something. Um, we are we the other thing we're asking for is a short term lease, probably two to four years that would allow us to lease a part of the existing building that is presently empty. And uh, some land outside of that in order for us to get some activity started up there, and I think everyone recognizes that. Um, the it, it would be good for the city to for residents to start seeing things happening up there. And so this is part of something that we can help contribute to uh, what the city is doing. Um, we would also like to have a, kind of a relocation clause because we understand that the final site plan may not have the recreation facilities where the present building is. Um, so we would want to uh, have some understanding of what would happen if we were uh, to, to relocate if that ends up not being the end site. And the third thing that we're interested in is um, something that we're calling an acreage commitment. Uh, and this is something we need uh, in order to get uh, grant, federal grants, state grants, and um, commercial loans, which are all part of what we need to finance the project. So once we uh, are able to get um, a site control, we can get access to those funds. Without site control, we can't get uh, access to that. And there's a number of ways that, that, a number of things that are considered site control, and one of them is a long-term lease. Um, and we've talked to uh, the commercial banks and they've told us that a, a um, uh, acreage commitment, which, basically says that we, the city of Montpelier, assuming that they go ahead with a recreational component, will allocate some land to uh, the hub to, for a long-term lease. And that would give us what we need to get the loans and the grants that, we're, that we need to apply for. How many acres? Uh, we're saying three to six acres. Um, that, you know, we, we, we probably need a minimum of three, but if we had six, that would give us more flexibility. Um, and um, I think I'm gonna let uh, some other members of the board um, give you a little bit more information and then we would ask for um, a resolution to, to move forward with um, authorizing the city administration to sign a memorandum of understanding. Before with you the go hub. there, um, yes. I had a question before you disappear. Sure. Um, and you said three points, but I listed them as four. One was the designated stakeholder, two was a short-term lease, three was a relocation clause, and four was an acreage commitment. I'm sorry, 
the relocation clause would be part of the short term lease because what we would be investing money in retrofitting the existing building and putting up some outdoor activities. And if we end up being told that's not where it's going to be, we would want to have some clause in there that would identify what happens then. Okay, so it's a subset. Okay, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to ask John Raydell, who's uh, been active in this pro program for a long time. Maybe you more really want to use the presentation now? Yeah, the site plan would be great. Yeah, okay. I'm John Ray Hill. Uh, I'm really a, a tennis player who got uh, involved in this when our first in fitness was sold and our courts went from four to three. So, one. Four to one. excuse me, four to one. Thank you, Nat. Uh, th this is a site plan that shows this amazing site and congratulations city uh, for now having possession. The uh, at the bottom of this, you can see the parking lot and the white thing is the Elks building. Um, and so you get a sense of how much, sort of half of it's covered by open field that used to be the golf course. And then the other wooded areas are more sloped. Um, we got uh, involved in this because we were looking for a place to replace the four court facility, sports barn. And this uh, city properties who owned this was amenable to ha leasing us the, the building and then doing a building uh, sports bar next door. And the parking is right there and it was, uh, uh, was going to be a pretty straightforward uh, arrangement. Um, what developed was they uh, decided then not to do golf. And it's like, wow, what? Uh, look at this amazing open land that's flat and uh, all kinds of uh, at this athletic groups approached us, disc golf, capital soccer. Um, there's a lot of interest in a practice golf. Uh, we're all of a sudden interested in, in getting involved with the hub to utilize this. And uh, one of the things that we get excited about it, and this is where Ethan said the, the, the sum is greater than the, or how does that work? The whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Um, we really felt that by having other multiple sports there, including some common facilities like daycare, and uh, as you probably know, the Elks Club had a restaurant there, uh, and um, that the previous owners had we're looking to lease it. And uh, we've been in conversation with Three Penny uh, to uh, use that restaurant. And we're, we're thinking that nothing is better than uh, if it's accompanied by food and the ability to get a sandwich or a beer. So that was a, a, a really important part of this, uh, something that's bigger than just a, a single place to, to have a single activity. Um, when the city decided to buy it, we uh, buy the property. Well, I should say that we, we presented to the city what, where we were in this, and um, we were kind of surprised that they had some plans for tennis facility down at the rec field. And I think they were surprised to see how nice this site was and what the potential was. And we sort of agreed on this public private partnership uh, and agreed that we weren't going to duplicate facilities and that uh, non-taxpayer funded stuff was, was probably an advantage um, and, and had some great conversations about the possibilities. Um, next slide, Cameron. This was a, uh, an image we gave because we're fundraising for this to pay for this. And uh, the, on the left is the, is the Elks building and on the right is the uh, new sports barn. Um, at the time, uh, the, 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 this would include this uh, gallery and a restaurant and game rooms and locker rooms, uh, daycare, virtual golf, uh, and all those things are, are uh, uh, still, still possible. This rendering is obviously out of date because we understand that the uh, and really support this this master planning uh, process. 
um, that location might change. And the, uh, what, what we're looking for really is a commitment to the concept, not the specifics. Um, so that just gives you a little, little background on uh, on how we got here, and we are excited about the prospect of moving ahead uh, in cooperation with you, with the city, uh, and this partnership. Yeah. Hi. I'm Nat Winthrop. I'm vice chair of the hub, a 40 year resident of Montpelier. <clears throat> and I have two kids and four grandkids who are also Montpelier residents. Um, what follows is a description of the hub's short and long term vision for the proposed public nonprofit partnership with the city. The two parties to the partnership will be independent and will operate on parallel tracks on our respective timetables. As John just described, the hub has been formulating plans since 2020 to create a nonprofit membership based indoor outdoor social and recreational center on the grounds of the former Elks Club property. In discussions with the city administration over the past several months, it became clear that a collaborative effort could create an exciting synergy that would offer a wider range of facilities than either entity could offer on its own. If the city, the city has recognized that it will see substantial benefit from the hubs investing over $3 million to create its complementary cluster of recreational amenities contiguous, presumably contiguous with the city's facility, recreational facilities. In March of this year, with the consent of the city administration, we applied for a three-year grant from the National Life of Vermont Foundation for a total of $75,000 from 2022 to 2024. Uh, we were granted uh, that amount. Uh, a centerpiece of this grant was to create a new childcare facility, presumably to be run by the city. Also in March, we met with the staff of the Vermont Community Loan Fund who gave us a quote letter of intent for a fixed 5% interest loan of up to $400,000. We've kept in touch and this offer is good, but only through next month, only through August of this year. After that, the to increase. Over the past nine months, we've explored the feasibility of installing two to three indoor virtual golf simulators in the existing building. This technology enables users to play uh, digital versions of famous golf courses like Pebble Beach and St. Andrews and also indoor golf practice and teaching environment. We've consulted with the golf pro at the Berry Country Club who confirmed that there is vigorous demand for such a facility and who fully supports our plans. But we also believe it is very important for the hub to be the first in the area to open such a facility, ideally in time for the upcoming winter to preserve our first to market advantage. We've also had multiple discussions with Wes Hamilton of Three Penny Tap Room, as John mentioned, and he has expressed strong interest in helping to renovate and then operate on a phased in basis, the restaurant and bar in the building that will be open to the public. 
Three Penny has an immediate need for a large prep kitchen and would like to host special occasions to include live music events. And Wes would be happy to talk to any of you. The hub is prepared to initiate starting renovations to the existing clubhouse building and creating limited adjacent outdoor recreational facilities as early next month or September. Uh, This is a floor plan of the existing building and uh, it's not actually empty. It's, it has three tenants who are on the right side of the uh, screen. And there's a woodworking shop, uh, Prevent Child Abuse Vermont, the nonprofit is in there and uh, ex existing preschool program run by the Waldorf School. So what we are proposing in terms of this short-term lease is actually just for the left-hand part of the building. And the uh, restaurant and bar are at the top left and the dark blue, it would be uh, outdoor seasonal patio seating. Um, Okay, many details concerning finance, construction, maintenance, and operation of the property and facility still need to be worked out. <clears throat> the hub board will continue to cooperate in good faith with the city through hub representation at meetings with managers, planners, and consultants, and at public me meetings as needed. <clears throat> After the proposed, sorry, <clears throat> after the proposed two to three year short term renewable lease runs its course, or at a point that Ethan alluded to earlier than that, if the city and its consultants determine the preferred location for both the hub facilities and the city's new recreational facilities, whichever comes first. The hub's expectation is that we will negotiate a long-term lease, 25 years plus with a city that will give us site control, which we need to be eligible for long-term bank loans and large public sector grants. Okay, the last slide, please, Cameron. Um, these are the advantages that we see to the city um, to approve uh, this memorandum of understanding and short-term lease. I won't bother reading all of them, but I wanna stress the last three bullets on here to provide families with middle and high school kids with a safe place that they can go after school, transportation provided, and hang out and learn sports-related skills if they so choose. So a, a big youth uh, component. Provide the city with a sh short to midterm facility for childcare. And lastly, take advantage of the opportunity to bring in the three penny tap room uh, as a flagship tenant on the property with a note that they are not able to wait two to three years. They, they would find a different satellite location, but they really are seriously interested in this one and are prepared to be flexible. Um, the fourth bullet point there has to do with uh, uh, the short-term time table. Uh, ensure that the, 
that the city has the opportunity to create, thank you, a synergetic public-private recreational complex uh, with private and public funds. And then we note this opportunity may be lost if the hub is unable to soon get a commitment, the commitment that we need to proceed with our project. And that largely has to do with uh, the Vermont Community Loan Fund and the letter of intent, which expires at the end of August. That's it for me. Yeah. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Donna. And then I, I want to frame up this discussion a little yeah, bit. Just a clarifying Yeah, question. for sure. Go ahead. Uh, you mentioned like the community fund and that the, we have this due date of August. Is that due date just for the short-term lease? Because you also mentioned about needing a long-term commitment, but I, I wasn't sure of the date of the long-term commitment. Um, Ethan, you may want to chime in here. But... Or are they, are they synonymous? Are they together? They could be together. Uh, it's or separate. But, but, but it's the short-term. We don't have the commitment for the long-term. We only have the commitment for the short-term. And for the long-term, we need the site control for the financing. Is that also an August date? No. Okay. That's when the city is uh, gets to the point in the planning, in your planning process, uh, where it is identified the best site for okay. both the city and the hubs Thank recreational you. facilities. Thank you. Uh, we We're, can certainly start once, once we have that commitment, we, we can start applying for grants. But until we have that, we can't apply. So, Ethan, just to interrupt, um, I want to make sure that people uh, at home can hear you as well. So, yeah, you yeah. Might if, want to so talk just for future point. comments, if you, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, not important right now. It's okay. Uh, right. So, uh, so in thinking about uh, this conversation, I, I, I do want to avoid uh, like negotiating by committee. All right. Like, I don't think that's. So I think we can boil this down to, you know, should we or should we should we not, you know, move forward with um, th some particular elements um, of this um, and not, I, um, if we can avoid the conversation about the details, I think that's best left um, to actually, you know, um, negotiating, um, which is not here. Um, so. Uh, the central question for me is is about the short-term lease. Um, you know, knowing that we haven't gone through the public process yet, and that is going to be really important for the future of this space. And I certainly want to um, honor that process, and because it may come out that you know we just want to do housing, like that's a, that's certainly possible. Um, or you know, to what degree are people interested in? you know, recreation and whatnot. Um, so given that we wanna honor the public process, um, do we wanna make, you know, how, how comfortable are we moving forward with some of these different elements? Um, uh, and the, the central one for me starts anyway with the, the short-term lease. Are we okay moving forward with the short-term lease while we wait for the public process to continue? Um, yes, kind of. Got a thumbs up from Donna. Okay. I thought she was just getting a consensus. Yeah, well, fair enough. Yeah. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, sh short term being the key word in this, but I'm, uh, I I'm actually feeling very optimistic about the way the discussion's going. I see it sort of as a courtship, like dipping the toe <laughs> in, right? Um, and what I, I liked about today is it feels like, and staff, I think, is doing great work with the hub. Uh, that there's a more clear delineation between, you know, what is the city doing? What is the hub doing? Because uh, a lot of concerns you get, ah, are we privatizing state functions? It's clear we're not here. And uh, there's a commitment to some of our priorities, right? Like childcare. Um, you know, I've been talking to people, we're paying like $45,000 in childcare, you know? If we can re relieve some of that, like right off the bat, that's a beautiful thing. Um, you know, it doesn't really change the footprint of the current space. And I, I see there's a constituent on there who's very concerned about, you know, the wildlife habitat. And, and I think that does need to really have a deep dive and look at that. But, you know, the, what this is won't affect it. And we can look at 
transportation options for the folks who would be using this as the interim as a trial basis to see how that would work for the whole kit and caboodle. Um, but no, I, I like the direction this is going. Cool. Other thoughts on Jack? Okay. okay. Thank you. Without, uh, you should rule me out of order if you think I'm talking about too many details, but I want to, I have some questions about what you're thinking is about this. Um, since the artist rendering that you showed us included what I think was the uh, the tennis barn there as a part of it. If we, at this point, if we agree to uh, the short-term lease for the property, would you plan to go ahead and build the, okay, you would, that's not, feasible on a short-term basis. Okay. That's right. And as John said, that uh, rendering is out of date. Uh, that was when we were still talking to city properties, the mm -hmm. former owners. Sure. Um, but but the, the, the what you showed us that's interior to the building, the restaurant and the, uh, and the ultra sedentary golf uh, program <laughs> uh, would be part of what you would do uh, on a short term basis. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, other thoughts, Carrie? Yeah, um, thank you for providing all this information. I have, um, I'm a little bit later to this process than some of the other city councilors since I just came on board in March. So I've been trying to play catch up a little bit. Um, and, um, and I appreciate getting the level of detail about what you would like to see that I've been, I've been wondering about that. So thank you for that. Um, I do uh, feel it's very important for us to honor the public process that we laid out. We approved uh, a very clear, very specific um, RFP to, to hire somebody to carry out this planning and implementation procedure. And I'm very happy with the thought that was put into that, the work that was put into that. Um, it's, it states in there very clearly that the process needs to be driven by public input. And certainly what I have heard a lot since before the election, as well as after the election is a sense from people in the public um, feeling like decisions are being made behind closed doors without the opportunity for public engagement. And I know that in the past couple of months, the city has been making a really tremendous effort to try to counter that. And I really appreciate that. Um, I would feel that deciding now to, to lease part of that property before we have gone through that planning process would really undermine our previous efforts to plan what to do with this property based on public input. Um, so I would not be in favor of a short-term lease at this point, um, whoever it was who was asking. And that's not a reflection on the kind of work that the hub wants to do, or um, it's not a, a, an indication of my thoughts about what future relationship we might have with the hub. But I just don't feel like now is the time for that. Okay, Donna. I guess I like the aspect of having the building that exists being used and that tenants, uh, four if you count the wood, woodworking. And I like that, that aspect on the short term. I, I don't know about how quick the long term, but I don't feel that violates whatever we're going to do with the public. That's just a different perspective. Um, so, so as long as it's staying within that same footprint, I'm very comfortable with it. Um, yes, go ahead. You, you, should, you should know that there are tenants there currently. Yes. Uh, so yeah, it, it, in half of that building. So that's going to be set for a couple of years anyway. Uh, okay, uh, Jennifer, go ahead. Um, I tend to agree with Carrie on this. Um, I've heard from a lot of constituents along those same lines, and um, I'm not sure how comfortable I am about rushing into something 
when we haven't really talked about what to do with that property. And I understand that they're under a timeline, so it makes it really complicated, but I feel like we need to really honor that process of involving the community just because it's been a very uh, long, long process and a lot of conversations thus far. And I would just hate to just throw that by the wayside as it were. Thank you. Um, Jack? Thanks. Um, I'm a little bit torn about this. I clearly the, the only part of this that I really feel would be any worth even discussing at this point is the is a short term lease we clear none of none of the other things really strike me as something that we should do until the completion of the public uh, planning process for the for the real estate the the question um, in my mind is what's it worth it to the city to say, well, we, this is an asset that we now own. We have the potential to uh, generate some revenue from that asset for the next uh, two or three years while the pro public process is going on. What's that worth? And uh, balancing that against uh, what Carrie and, uh, Jennifer have expressed, which, which I share, which is that we need to be very clear with the public that uh, anything we do with this land is being driven by the needs and wishes of our constituents. And so that's where I am. Uh, I'm, I'm go ahead and, and, and even lease the uh, the building at this point, but uh, I'm not 100% no on that. Uh, as far as the other longer term things uh, are concerned, I don't think see how we can possibly do that at where we are standing right now. So one, okay, go, go ahead now, yeah. I just respect, I mean, we're very uh, respectful public input process and feel it's essential, not just important, but essential. Uh, remind people that uh, the council voted on November 17th uh, to have the city go ahead and explore this public nonprofit partnership idea. And we've been meeting consistently with the city uh, over the past, ever since then, over the past eight months. Also, that the uh, voters approved uh, the ballot item, which explicitly mentioned uh, recreation as one of the three that would be uh, the focus of the property. Thank you. Uh, Carrie, go ahead. And yeah, I, I um, in trying to get myself up to speed on this, I, I did some digging through old city council minutes um, and watching the video of the November 17th meeting to try to get a sense of what, what did happen. Um, and and it, it's not accurate to say that city council voted um, on anything. There was no vote at all. There was a discussion uh, and there was a um, sort of a general uh, asking, the city staff was asking for direction from council about what to explore and the what it looked like to me from watching the video was that the um, the council was presented with three basic options, renovate the existing building, build something new down at the, the rec field, or um, work with the, with the hub to build something new. And the direction that the, the informal direction that the city council gave was explore something new, don't spend time exploring renovating the existing building. And so that is, um, uh, that was instructive for me to, to understand that we, we had kind of given a go ahead to, to, look, to look into this more and to continue to explore these options and that um, staff said they would come back with updates for us, which has been happening. Um, but it's not quite uh, the same as the council decided to pursue a public-private partnership 
Um, so I just want to say that. I also want to say that the I am still completely in the dark about what a public-private partnership would look like uh, between the city and the hub, and which is not a criticism and not to say that I know there's been a lot of thought about it, but what, what I'm hearing a lot about is what the hub wants to do and not so much about the partnership between the two. And it, and I'm very interested in having those conversations and it may be that a, a partnership, I mean, it could look lots of different ways. It may simply be that the city leases property to the hub and the hub does their thing. Um, or it could be any number of other things, but I don't, I don't have any clear sense of that vision. And so I, I would be unwilling to embark on a path that commits us to that kind of partnership without having a clearer idea of what it might actually be. Well, thank you for that clarification. Uh, I had forgotten that, but rings true in my memory. Um, um, yeah, I mean, we don't need to use the word partnership. It was actually uh, Cameron who originally uh, introduced that term um, we can call it a collaboration. We can call it landlord tenant. If it is a partnership, we are a very minor partner. You know, we're talking about three to six acres out of 130 something acres. Uh, so X, we, we can, and we should stop calling it the Elks Club property. I mean, we, we need to work on uh, terminology. That's fair. Uh, Donna, go ahead. I do remember that it was a consensus, but I, I did feel it was a consensus to move forward. And I do want more private public partnerships, except with what I could call integrity of intent until you make those agreements. But when particularly Cameron talked about and Bill came back um, about how we could supplement one another maybe the city would do these courses and maybe the hub would do that. And I mean, I see public partnerships in that land with development and it may not just housing. I, mean, I just see, I want more of that because that's how we're gonna stretch our talents and our dollars. And it doesn't reduce what I feel is public input. I think it maximizes us. It gets us out of our little preconceived notions. And I, I feel that designating them as stakeholders. I could do that. I could do the short-term lease. I could do reco relocation clause. Maybe we'll put you in the back of five acres. <laughs> no. Um, and I could even the three to five acres of commitment. I mean, I, I feel that, that that's a positive thing um, because, you know, you have three, t you have four table legs, but you got to move one of them and to have that land sit there dormant or maybe have half of the building with our three tenants um, just doesn't seem as viable. It doesn't seem energy. I want energy in that place. And I may be, definitely seems like maybe a minority, but I, I don't see any kind of forward motion with you at this level with the things you've asked counter to public input at all. Um, so that's just a different perspective. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, I do want to go to Peter Kelman, uh, since you've got your hand raised, go ahead. Um, uh, I, I think the last two things that were said are very interesting, Donna and Carrie. What if uh, we started the public input process right now with a series of public charrettes where you bring in the public to help define what a public-private uh, collaboration with respect to the recreation part of this would be. Uh, there's no reason why that couldn't, couldn't really be, be done. And I think that the uh, hub people have a good point. You already have some tenants. So, and you're not gonna be getting rid of them at any time soon. So that the addition of a tenant in, this, in the footprint that already exists with an, with an understanding that they could be moved out of that really um, if the public were engaged in that, in that process very quickly, I think most members of the public would understand that that's a good deal. I think you guys are absolutely right, Carrie and Jennifer and Jack, to say 
We've got to honor that public process. But why don't we do it? Let's do it now. Thank you. Um, thank you. Well, so um, on the, um, so I have a couple of thoughts. One is, uh, so we're, we're hiring someone to do um, that process. Um, so I, I don't necessarily see us shorting that process um, as as yet. But um, I, I would say, I think you raise a, a good point, you know, that that space already has tenants in it. We're not, um, we're not kicking them out. Uh, we're making some money off of that. Um, I, I am comfortable uh, moving forward with a short term lease with the understanding that it's a short term and we're going to let the public process move forward and um, and see see what it says, and um, you know, acknowledge that it could just be a short term lease, um, just depending. But uh, that, but anyway, that's where I'm at. Just so you know. Um, but uh, yeah, other other thoughts. Uh, the alternative too is that we haven't heard from Lauren, and that we could table this and, and wait till we've got um, Lauren back with us. Um, that might also give you some more time to to chew on this um, and, and be comfortable one way or the other. Um, just putting that out there. Um, what are folks' preferences? Yeah, Jack. I'm not willing to decide anything tonight. I am happy to keep the discussion going. Okay. Um, including putting this on for another uh, meeting with uh, maybe a little more clarity for the public of what's being discussed. So people who have concerns, and I know I've uh, heard from some people who are just totally against a private entity uh, being uh, ensconced in this property uh, or operating a, a private facility on this property. I think ha having more clarity on what is going to be discussed for a future agenda seems like a good plan to me. Okay. Um, and so to be fair, I did use the word table, but there's no motion actually. So there's nothing technically to table, but we could put it on a future agenda. Um, I, I just want to check in. David Delcor, I saw your hand. I don't know if you want to... If you have a question or a comment, just want to make yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, just so I'm clear, you know, is what's being proposed one short-term lease, and if Three Penny were to be a tenant, that they would be subleasing from the hub, or is it two separate short-term leases? I mean, it's just unclear to me, and and if there's an answer to that, I'd like to hear it. Great. Uh, I didn't catch the exact question, but what I was going to say anyway is uh, there were existing tenants that had leases, existing leases when we took over the building. And we, we told them that we would honor their existing leases till conclusion that we were not making any commitments about what happened beyond those leases, but that we would not kick them all out on closing day either because we didn't have immediate use of the building. We might also consider renewing them, but we didn't. So that was the commitment we had. The city hasn't gone and leased space to anybody. We've we've taken on leases. Um, just want to make that clear. And I think um, to further answer David's question, the, the discussion right now is really just about a potential short-term lease with the hub. Correct. Right. Yes, our assumption is that we would sublet to three penny. But that's to be decided later between a, if yeah. the council approves some sort of motion. Okay. Um, if the council doesn't approve a motion next month, if not now, um, I've got to say that our, you know, I emphasize the, the Vermont Community Loan Fund uh, letter of intent and their 5% willingness and that has to do with the current footprint the current building and very limited uh contiguous outdoor uh facilities um if that goes by the wayside 
the hub, the hub board has already started to discuss the possibility of looking for a, a different place and basically starting all over again. So that's a very real possibility. And I would just emphasize the synergy that's we think is a mutual vision between the city and the hub for uh, you know what what could be possible in terms of recreation. Okay. Well, thank you. Um, yes, Carrie. Yeah, I I um I very sympathetic to that, and um, really understand your need to move relatively quickly and not necessarily on the same timeline as the city. Um, and uh, I, I, I spoke very strongly about honoring that public process and I stand by that. Um, but I would say that if we were going to continue this conversation and perhaps make a decision um, to do things a bit differently, I would find it extremely helpful. And I think a lot of people in the public would find it helpful if you would provide specifics of what you're asking for in a form that it's accessible to the public more easily than watching the video of this meeting. So you, you, you've given us some, some things that you would like to see in a short term, term lease and um, verbally, it would be just so helpful to have that in writing if you were willing to do that. I'd just like to comment on that. I hope my head isn't shining too brightly <laughs> on the... Um, uh, we would be happy to throw out a lot of different ideas of what might happen. What we're asking the council to do is to authorize the administration to negotiate those details with us rather than trying to negotiate them publicly. And that I think is sort of standard practice in these things. So if we're talking about what would the partnership look like? We have a lot of ideas. We've talked with Bill and Cameron and, and um, uh, Mike Miller and uh, all the staff they're all ideas. What would actually come out of it has to be settled. And I don't think that could be settled in uh, a public forum. Ideas can come up. We come up with a uh, memorandum of understanding that both parties can, can live with. Uh, we have ideas of what that could look like. Those are our, our ideas, as you, as you point out. You know, we're not here to you know, and most of the ideas we have, we've talked to, to Bill and Cameron about already, and we're pretty much have a clear understanding of what it is. There may be details that we need to work out. Uh, we would be very happy to talk more about what we hope the hub would become and do a PR campaign around that if that is important. Um, but the whole process is the whole the whole process of making a, uh, I, I don't think a public-private partnership is a black box. It's, it's pretty clear. A public-private partnership is private component and a public component. And how, how that's broken out in the partnership. In this case, to make it very simple, uh, I, I tried to uh, outline it uh, by saying that we have identified what the recreational needs are in the community together with the city administration. We will divide up who will do what, who will create it, who will operate it and who will maintain it. And we have ideas of all of those things, but that hasn't been signed off on yet. So we can uh, do a charrette as was being proposed and the public can get involved in throwing additional ideas out. And we talk about who does, you know, who creates it who operates that we're very open to, but without knowing that this is actually going to happen on that property, that's a lot of our, you know, we're, we're a volunteer board. None of us are paid, we don't have a staff. So it's all of our efforts and resources and time that we're putting into making this happen. And um, in asking the council to uh, give the administration permission to negotiate a memorandum of understanding with us, uh, we, you know, we're, we're saying we need something more than just talking about it. We, we need something that, that A, we can take to get the, the funds that we need 
that we are, we are going to invest in that property and we need certainty. We, we need to know that the efforts that we're making is going to lead to something. And um, that, that's kind of where we are. And it's, it, we're not separating the recreational needs of the community you know, from what we're trying to do. We're trying to meet those needs and, we're, and, and, and the city is trying to meet those needs. Both, both of those have been identified as important needs. So I understand that there's a lot of unknowns, but th those don't become known until we have an understanding of what's gonna happen. I mean, a lot of that, it just remains unclear until, until we have cert some certainty about, are we gonna actually have a place we can build this? That's, and that's where we are. Um, I'm gonna go to Jennifer and then Donna, yes. Um, yeah, thank you, Mayor Watson. Um, I guess my hesitance is, is, you know, we keep talking about the recreation needs of the community and from the emails I've received and from my neighbors and my own family, tennis and golf are not the recreation needs that are on the top of our list right now. Um, and so I, I would like to have like deeper conversations about what else besides golf and a sports bar and tennis would be available if people were having a membership and you know if, if this moved forward I, I just I would feel better knowing that there would be more than just those two options because for for people in my district and and where I live that's not a priority for them um whereas you know swimming and exercise classes and other stuff like that that we're not able to access at the current rec center um, those are the things that I'm, I'm being asked by my constituents. So just something to think about, I guess. Yeah, thank you. I'm gonna go to Donna and then I see your hand, uh, Daniel Voisin. Oh, one of the pieces, Jennifer, you may not have gotten that, that came in a late attachment mentions a different variety of things that you might wanna look at. But what I really wanted to talk about was when Bar Hill thanks to Jesse Baker spent a lot of time, thanks to our commitment uh, to give her the time to get Bar Hill here. All we were really thinking about is we had somebody who's gonna use water and give us jobs. And look what a social service center that has become. Who would have thought on Berry Street? I, and that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at, at whole, I can't say that word, energy, so synergy. Thank you. Um, it really to step back and I, I just, I got a little pinch when people keep saying, I want to honor public input. It isn't that I'm not honoring public input. I just see it as a role that's separate from a tenant in this building. And I see it as building a partnership of only plus energy that I've seen coming out of the hub, just like we saw with Bar Hill plus energy. So I'd like people just to sort of step out of um, front porch form <laughs> discussions and just think, you know, if you had somebody walking up the street and say, we've got $3 million, we're going to put in a land that's going to complement what you're doing. We're going to work with you to make sure we don't duplicate. I think that's cool. I just, I think it's cool. Fair enough. Yeah. Uh, Daniel Voisin. Thanks, Mayor Watson uh, and the rest of the city council. Just to make sure people are aware, I am a board member of the hub. I'm also the president of the Under River Nordic Ski Club and a local advocate of recreation that's not ball sports. I don't play tennis and I'm under 50 and I'm on the board of the hub. So I guess that makes me unique. Um, anyway, I wanted to uh, just advocate um, and, and respond to uh, Councillor Morton's uh, statements on, on what we are looking at for the, for the hub. This is one component of a larger recreational facility for sure. I mean, and and swimming and indoor sports and 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 those sorts of classes and and, and activities are, are clearly part of that picture. Um, but here we have a, a, a nearly ready-made component of a larger recreational facility that's ready to hit the ground. And I think if we delay, um, we're going to lose it. 
we're going to lose that opportunity and it's going to be down the street. And it's not going to be part of this, this development. Um, and I think that that would be a real shame. Um, and, you know, as I said, like I, I advocate for the, the cross country. We, we've been doing the grooming up at the, the golf course. And I believe the community has been extremely supportive of that activity uh, for free. It's been a great thing, a great partnership with the city within our club. And I really think that those sorts of arrangements are, are, are crucial to the ongoing recreational use of this property. And it clearly has you know, benefits to the future residential use of that property. Um, and open space for that matter, you know, maintaining uh, a good open space and, you know, one that is used in a passive way. I think that there's just a lot of synergies there as, as Councillor Bate had pointed out. So, I mean, I'm, I, I have a, a lot of uh, ideas for, for future use of the property. Um, and, and I just want to make sure that the, that the council is aware of some of the timeliness on this. I don't believe it's a big ask to enter an MOA uh, on this on this issue, there are certainly details to suss out later, um, and you know, with the ask of even a three to six acre commitment that we're talking like that's four percent of the overall property. So I, I, it's really not that big of big an ask. So I, I really wish you, uh, as we as we enter this discussion, to really consider strongly that this is a very vital partnership for this success of this project. Thank you. Yeah. <clears throat> so uh, I uh, am also still um, in this place where I, I feel like we ought to be earning uh, some further income from this asset, but um, I also uh, just see that we may not be at a place where we can make a decision tonight. Is that, I just want to check in with you, Jack, you're, you're, that's still where you're at. Okay. Um, so I guess what I would, I, what I think probably makes the most sense is to put this on a, another um, future agenda um, item, if that's, if that's okay with you, um, unless, uh, yeah, go ahead. It would need to be the very next meeting, wouldn't it? Our first meeting in August. Um, August 24 is our next meeting. I don't know that it has to be the next one. Yes. Yes. As far as we're concerned, oh, for, it does oh, have you. to be the next one. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, um, Trying to think of what else is on that agenda, but I, we can we'll make, it we'll make it work. Yeah. Okay. And I mean, we've just spent 45 minutes plus on this. Uh, well, what would you want from us if it's not a draft of a short term lease? Which I agree with Ethan. Uh, I don't think that's the way the process usually works. There are right. three existing tenants with leases, we'd be a fourth tenant. So what would you be looking to, to us to provide next month? Do we make another presentation that takes a half hour or whatever? I, I would assume the, the answer would be no to that, uh, assuming that we're all um, you know, up to speed on, on this information. Is there anything additional that would be useful that you can, I you would, can think I of? I would say that, um, first of all, to, to you folks, they're missing a council member tonight. They are missing a council member tonight. So there's a one voice at the table that's not here. And I realize that can happen, but if it's gonna be three, three, then you need the fourth yeah. person anyway um, to, to make a decision. Um, so there, that's a practical reality. Uh, I think uh, speaking for them, and and I have no sort of authority to do so, I would imagine that now that this has been more formally presented, it will be in the public eye, they have more of an opportunity to talk to people and get more input themselves and feedback. Mm -hmm. We perhaps could do some, um, you know, polling, we, have, we now have a new polling thing, we could try putting out some questions to the community and to so have a better sense of, because the critical question here, and the reason we're here, as is, is I explained to you, is not the terms of the lease per se, or it's, is this subjugating the, the public process, which is why I said, I can't, I can't make this decision about whether it's committing anything further. I can talk to you all we want about the terms of the partnership and all those things, if it's what the council wants to do. But they're the stewards of the, the public land at this point and the public process. And so this is squarely a policy call and I suspect they want to have 
uh, as much comfort with whatever they decide um, before they do it. And 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 you've been clear about what your your needs are. And and I, I don't know. I mean, it's up to you. You, you can represent yourselves however you, you choose to. But I don't know. yeah, go ahead. Would it be helpful to uh, give more? Uh, visuals and have three penny come to explain that you sounded like sort of understanding what might happen might be more useful to you is that would that be helpful yeah i'm looking at um no i have a pretty good idea what three penny does and would do so um but i think it would be helpful to i'm i'm, I'm imagining as i'm talking with constituents about this over the next month when i say that that there's been a request for a short-term lease they're going to ask me well what would they be doing there with that space and so, so it would be helpful it would be helpful i don't it wouldn't be helpful to to get a presentation from three penny but it would be helpful to to have some clear specifics that you know you're you're hoping to sublet to three penny you're going to have this visual golf virtual and, golf. virtual golf sorry and i those are the only specifics that i that i have heard so if there are other specifics that would be great if not, that's fine. But to be able to answer those questions, so that would be helpful. It would be it would be helpful. Okay. Although, but please don't bring three penny in for a presentation okay. about running a bar, <laughs> <laughs> if you don't mind. <laughs> right, right, right. Okay, so for now, to be continued. Um, I think actually for that next meeting, it, it probably I know I said you know we were all here. We don't need anything further. But it, it probably wouldn't hurt to give a very brief overview if there are folks from the public who are participating, who were not a part of this discussion so that they have a little bit of context. Um, maybe not the, the whole presentation again, but um, just some highlights or basics would be useful. Um, like the five or 10 minute version of the presentation probably. Yeah, yeah. Um, is, yes, go, go, go. oh, Donna, go ahead. So, our, I mean, all the material they've given it, that's gonna be posted on the website? Well, okay, because there's a lot of information in that already. Yes. Okay, good. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. Um, I look forward to another conversation at our next thank meeting. You. Yeah, thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, and you yeah, thank you. thank you, yeah. All right, so just being conscious of time here, I do, I do think that we should try to punch out the rest of this, these, uh, these items. I think we can do it. Um, 12 to 16 main. Do you want to do you want to tee that one up? Sure. Um, yes. So um, we're at our two hour break. Two hours since our break. Actually, yeah. two hours and 15 minutes. Are we gonna break? Are we just gonna go straight through? What would you what would you like to do, team? Would you like to My only, go only one with the bladder? <laughs> I'm happy to break if anyone else wants to break. Yeah. Long. Sure. Okay, so like how about like five minutes? Five minutes? Okay, five minutes. Uh, so we'll be back at 1034. Just, yeah, right, exactly. Yep. We're all back. Okay. All right, so 12 to 16 Maine. Do you want to tee that one up? Okay, go for it. Certainly will. This has actually been on our agenda for quite some time, waiting to sort of circle back around. Um, for those that are not totally familiar, uh, 12 to 16 Main Street is the lot that used to be Montpelier Beverage and uh, the place for the Association for the Blind and Visually uh, Impaired. Uh, more recently, the Girton Park site. It's that combination of lots. There were actually were three lots, 12, 14, and 16. Uh, so at the time, the city, uh, city acquired those properties for the uh, bike path project, and we all tied in with the One Taylor project, thinking that we were going to be using all of them uh, for where the bike path goes and where that new road goes in. At some point, we realized there would be some space left, and um, as part of our negotiations to purchase Montpelier Beverage, had reached in a, a, a sort of a, wasn't really a swap. It was going to be two distinct, you know, pur purchases. But we were going to purchase their property, then they were going to purchase this, this what is now the city open land plus that parking lot in the back, and build a, a private building, and we'd work that out with the state, and. Um, Literally the day before the closing, they pulled out of it and said, we'll just sell you the land. 
And so we had to do this because we were already years behind on the project. We had to complete, so we bought the, the land as is. Um, I won't bore you, there was a snag with the state funding. We've re that's all paid up. So we own the property free and clear. And the, the city council had begun discussions about what to do with the land. And we'd actually put together a working group, which ultimately said, let's do a mass, you know, let's fit it into the downtown master plan. And uh, we've copied you that. Uh, and ultimately the, the recommendation in that plan was to develop it commercially. And we were kind of heading that way, uh, waiting until we'd paid off our, what we owed the state for non-transportation use of the property. And then COVID hit. And so we had other things to tend to and didn't really get around to this. So this was on our agenda to sort of address in a big picture way. Anyway, then I think obviously the activity at Girton Park really called into uh, light that space. So we look at the choices. I, I've tried to list them here in the cover sheet. Uh, basically just leave it as open space, green space, wouldn't really cost us much of anything other than mowing it, put flowers in, whatever. Um, next step up would be to make it as sort of an open park and rec space, uh, maybe with a plan for structures or other amenities, maybe a public bathroom, could tie it in with the Confluence Park design, so that, you know, on either side of the river. Obviously that would require some design cost and, and implementing it. Construct a city facility, like a public bathroom, possibly a service center. Um, you know, it might be something that comes out of the, the, the homelessness uh, uh, task force RFP. Again, that's gonna have costs and implementations. Uh, we could uh, seek proposals for the use of the land with us, uh, maybe just leasing it. We could, we could ask for certain outcomes. Uh, I'm not sure who want to do a lot for lease, but they might, maybe they build a tennis barn there. Um, and then we could seek proposals for the sale of a property with a requirement. So we could say, we'll sell you this land. You could do something, but you have to have to have housing. You have to have a public bathroom, et cetera. Um, and that we would get the sale revenue. My, my sense is that the more restrictions we put on, the lower the, you know, we're going to get less price because somebody has to accommodate doing these other things as part of their projects, or we could put it out to seek open, you know, open proposals. We could say, you know, create our own scoring mechanism for the proposal, but not make it hard and fast and see what we get based on the combination of price and, and proposal. And, you know, obviously then we would get the sale revenue and presumably the tax revenue from whatever comes. So, you know, obviously financially, I think that's, that's the most beneficial to the city. Um, that's the one we and staff are recommending um, because that was what was consistent with the master plan that was put out a couple of years ago. Now, times have changed. So, um, but we really should, uh, you know, put this, the reason I said consider a minimum bid of 134,000 is that's what the city paid um, to pay off the, the state transportation funds over a two year period. So it would be nice to at least recoup that back at minimum. Um, but it, I would assume if it's truly commercial and open lot, downtown lot, they would not on that. I'm sorry, I, 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 my hunch is, and I'm not a, an assessor or anything, but that a, an open lot like that in downtown Montpelier with potentially some parking attached to it um, might be worth a lot more than $134,000. So those are the choices. We don't have to decide tonight, but it would be nice to get at least a sense of people's thinking. Obviously, the more clarity we can get, the more we can start then coming back to you with plans for how to proceed in whatever direction you like. Well, so I so appreciate uh, all your work on this and the, the clear delineation of the choices. Um, I think that uh, helps our conversation uh, to be clear. Um, I know what I would like to see there, but I wanna start with all of you what, um, what what are you thinking? Which which option seems best to you? Yeah, I, I think I'd lean strongly towards uh, five understanding uh, that it might be somewhat restrictive, but I, I think that space is custom designed for affordable housing uh, right near Shaw's walking distance to everything in town here. And, uh, you know, for to really address homelessness, 
best thing you can do is build housing. Um, public restroom, I'd be really, I don't think we have a clear picture in our heads of what that necessarily could look like. Would it be lockers? You know, would it be showers? And if that were the case, could we run into some of the same issues as Dearden Park, given the location that it's at there? So I think we need a more strategic plan for that, but uh, affordable housing, affordable housing. <laughs> Fair enough. Other thoughts? Uh, uh, okay, go ahead, Jack. Um, I, I think part of it depends on uh, what our possible time frame is. And, and part of why I say that is that when we talk about development of affordable housing um, or housing of any kind, part that requires a developer with the capacity to do it. And, uh, <clears throat> and we know there aren't many affordable housing developers, developers in the city or in the area and uh, whether they have the capacity to do this on any time frame, given that they may be working with the uh, with the Christchurch people for that proposed idea, I'm just not sure how feasible it is. I think I think it's worth looking at. I I see this sort of as a hybrid of five and six. Um, I, I do think something. Uh, should be developed here, and I think <clears throat> if if some kind of combination of commercial and uh, and housing were to be developed, whether it's uh, affordable housing or not, you know we need housing every type of tenure and every uh, every price point, and so that that's where I am right now. Okay. Um I think Carrie, and then we're going to go to Jennifer and then Dan Groberg. I would really like to see affordable housing there. Um, and I recognize the kind of obstacles that Jack is talking about. So, I mean, maybe what I'm, I'm not sure exactly what he means by hybrid option, but um, that's kind of where my thinking is going as well to say that we have this very strong preference for housing to be there. Um, maybe there's a certain percentage of it that we would like to see as affordable housing at a minimum. Um, and then, but to, I, I just, I wouldn't want the complete lack of interest in that to stop us from selling it at all. You know what I mean? You know, so if there was just, if there's just no affordable housing developer who could come along and do that. Um, though I guess I'd actually like to, to, uh, to consider the possibility that maybe we, we would need to just wait for that. Um, so, so I guess I'm a little bit mushy about it after all, well, sorry. To be clear, um, and I know there's people waiting to speak, but just for clarity, and I thought I put it in there, but you know, we also might want to consider maybe retail on the first floor or yep. some kind of business type thing. Um, but we could say, you know, we're seeking proposals for this land. The, these are the highest, you know, this, we would weigh this over, you know, even price. Like, these are the, the proposals and then see what we get. And then we can weigh the, the price proposal versus what the, the public value. And, and like you say, then if, if nobody seeks to do, I mean, obviously we would reach out to them. I'm, I'm just saying you could, we can still ask for what we want, but not necessarily require it. Right. That's what I'm saying. And, and that's cool. Right. Um, uh, go ahead, uh, Jennifer, and then Dan, and then Donna, I, I assume you want to weigh in. Yeah. Sorry, I'm going to just be the wet blanket tonight. <laughs> I feel oh, like we should good. just leave it green space. Uh, global warming folks, <laughs> we're going to run out of green space. But if, if, if green space isn't an option, I feel like a public bathroom would be aces. That's a really good spot for anybody to stop in the middle of their day and just take care of business. Um, I'm gonna just take a little prerogative here. 
So my thought, I was also psyched for it to be um, a park or, or open space, uh, a green space uh, in our, in downtown, though open to other thoughts as well. That's that's fine. Um, Dan, go ahead. Hi, everyone. I'm Dan Groberg. I'm the executive director of Montpelier Alive. Um, I'll just, so first of all, I want to say that Montpelier Live is very supportive of outdoor recreation and green space. We serve on the Confluence Park Steering Committee and are working with Montpelier Parks on a VORAC funded project to promote the outdoor economy in Montpelier. Um, I'll also say that you hired experts to put together a study. They put a lot of work into this interviewing stakeholders and um, getting quite a significant public engagement. Actually, I thought it was a pretty um, well designed process. And you know they're recommending that the highest and best use for this property is as commercial space. There's uh, demand for housing. Um, as Jack mentioned, there's demand for housing at all levels and uh, more housing makes housing more affordable, even if it's market rate housing, it uh, helps to have more housing in the market in general. Um, and I know that there's interest from at least one developer in building a property that would have first floor retail and uh, housing above it. Uh, there's also continued demand for commercial retail space um, in the downtown. Um, so, you know, I would encourage you to, you know, heed the recommendation of your consultants um, and uh, go with option five or six. I, I don't think that, um, you know, saying that it's commercial precludes you from, um, you know, putting some recommendations on the property. I will say that um, my understanding of the pro forma that is that um, even market rate housing with none of these stipulations um, is a, a, a challenging project. Um, so, no, that's something to think about, um, but I would encourage you strongly to consider option five or six. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Donna, go ahead. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm gonna mirror the same thing as having that building mirror what's around it, that we have retail on the first floor and then upstairs housing. And I feel that it should be a nudge and not maybe an absolute. I don't want to corner ourselves. We can consider and then reject. But that would be my tendency. And I do think we need bathrooms, folks, on State Street. We have a bathroom at Shaw's. We have City Hall. We have the fire department. But on State Street, there's nothing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you're saying this might not be the place for the for bathrooms? Me, it is okay. It's State Street that has nothing but private residents. Okay. Um, Peter Kilman, go ahead. Hi, all again. <laughs> um, I just want to say a couple of things. One is that that plan was done pre-pandemic. That problem was that plan was done pre-explosion of homelessness. I don't think we should be referring to that plan. On the other hand, I thought it was a great plan, and I'd love to see a commitment to the rest of it, which is the development of the riverscape and access to the river, and you know. Uh, Take a look at that whole plan. This property is not going to make or break that plan. And I don't think what you do with this property should be based on that. And I do think that it is, I think Bill has a good idea. Let's put it out there. Let's tell people what we value. We value housing, affordable if possible. The idea of public facilities, it might actually be more than a bathroom, might be uh, showers as well. But again, this piece of property isn't going to solve the whole thing. So don't, I, I get nervous when I hear people putting all their chips on this thing. Oh, it can do this. It can do that. It can do, it's going to do a little, let's do this and do the rest of it. The downtown needs a lot of work. Barry Street needs a lot of work. And, and, and they're, they're, you know, there are plans, but I think we need to go further with those plans. You, you guys have been reading about all the complaining about the Granite Street Bridge. That's part of it too. You guys, I'm sure have heard that the, that the, the, the River Street, Main Street, Northfield Street intersection is a death trap. I mean, we don't even have lines that tell people about right turns and straight ahead and left turns. They're erased and they haven't been replaced. And I just wanna say, I'm gonna stop in a minute. We, we've got to take care of some very basic things like the, those intersections. And we, it'll, whatever you're going to do here is going to take a while. Let's 
take care of some of those other things as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, uh, Connor, did you weigh in? You did. You, you did. You did. That's right. Okay. I'm sorry. Whew. Okay. Um, that is late. Uh, all right. So it seems like there is <laughs> um, at least a majority of folks interested in something, um, which is fine. Would you like to make a motion about that? Would that, I mean, that would be the most clear. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Is there a motion? Connor. Uh, I'll move we go with option five with a uh, strong preference to housing, knowing that uh, it may limit the responses. Is there a second? Is when you say housing, I, I, do you mean housing? With, with retail and housing mixed retail uh, housing? I, it's, it sounds like it's most realistic that we'll get bids if that's the case. So well, it's it would consistent be, with our sort of yeah. downtown streetscape. So we'll be open to that. Okay, I'll second that if you include retail. Okay. Uh, Carrie. Um, so option five speaks to a requirement, but you use the word preference. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, okay, that sounds good. Um, won't do a requirement, strong preference. Does that make sense, sounds fair? No, can you, can you, just, you Got it. Wait, did you, what, did you understand? Four. Okay. I believe that he was saying, stopped calling it option five. You wanted to put it out for proposals with a strong preference for housing with potential retail. Yeah, number five, scratch requirement, but a strong right. preference. Okay, okay. And no, 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 housing. no. So it's not no option five. It's not no strictly numbers. number five. Um, and your second, so it's a preference for housing with retail on the first on the first floor. floor. Yeah. Okay. And that's, that's you that you're seconding that. Okay. Further discussion on that option. Jennifer, no, okay. And I assume Dan's hand is still from the last time. Um, okay, so further discussion? Okay, all in favor, please say aye. 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 And opposed? Wait, just so I know, Jennifer, which way did you vote? Oh, you voted aye. You voted aye. I'm just, just clarifying. Okay, all right. Uh, so no roll call. And and it's unanimous then. Okay. All right. So all right. Clarity. Yay for clarity. Um, clarity is kind of awesome. Okay, we're gonna move on to the parklet ordinance. Um, anything you want to say about this? I'll try to be super quick because we've talked about this one before. Um, we have we had a permanent parklet ordinance. We relaxed the standards uh, in conjunction with the state the last couple of years because of the pandemic. What we've learned is that, I believe what we've learned is that the, the more parklets, the, the more use of parking spaces isn't bad. It's a good thing. People seem to like them. And so when we talked about this earlier, the council, you had sort of given general direction to that we should incorporate the safety standards of the prior ordinance with the more permissive standards as far as use, number of spaces, et cetera, of the temporary. So that's what it was an attempt to draft this for first reading. There is one piece that has to do specifically, ironically, with three penny because their dimensional requirements aren't the same. So we're gonna to have to add something in about a, a, a waiver that once that happens, then they have it. But we can have that for first reading if that's something you'd like. But really, I'm basically saying is this draft ready to go for first of two readings too. And, and one of the, I mean, obviously it doesn't have to go super fast, but the sooner I think that we can tell parklet people that if they wanna do it next year, they could actually construct something that, you know, they can start planning for it now instead of us enacting this in February. And then, you know, so like the, the ones that just have the orange things or a couple of flower pots and stuff, those will not be considered safe. They will have to be constructed in, in a way like, so that if a car at slow speed bumps into them, no one will get hurt. Yes. 
So, so would it be appropriate to make a motion that the parklet ordinance as presented move forward to first reading? Yes. That's my motion. With a direct staff to make uh, an adjustment for a variance or occasional variances. Okay. Well, so actually, could we, could we talk about it real quick before we have a motion? Um, uh, so I just want to um, back up from that a little bit. You're really so, supposed to do it the opposite way, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's all good. Oh, that's true. Bad. Bad. Oh, oh, yeah. So the reason I wanted to interrupt this because um, I, so you talk about the need for adding in a section about a waiver for um, through basically diagonal parking spots. Um, I so I, I guess I just want to put out there that I think it would make sense if possible if we could not make it a waiver situation but actually just build it in, you know, for diagonal parking spots. This sure. is this is the situation. It's not necessarily a, a waiver, um, which sure. makes it a little more ten tentative. Um, because, you know, there, it's possible that Hugo's or some other restaurant um, in those spaces might want, um, want, want something in a diagonal parking spot. So just making it really clear, I think would be helpful. And um, also I think it could be useful uh, um, you know, once, so once a, a restaurant, because they are really mostly for restaurants at this point, um, invests a lot of money in this, uh, it is helpful to, to them to know whether or not they're going to be able to use it for multiple seasons. And so I think having some clarity around, uh, like basically grandfathering, um, I'm not sure what, if there's like a better word for that, but you know what I mean? Like, do, do they need to keep reapplying every year? Um, so the, yeah. Yeah, to, to that point, the, the original point of the length of time in the reapplying was because of the limit on parking spaces. There were only six spaces in the whole downtown that were allocated for this. So the idea being is, you know, maybe after a couple of years, somebody else will want to do it. If, if that goes away, then really, as long, you know, if someone's in and they're staying in and they can, you know, I think the only issue might be if, because we had that once, if somebody goes out of business, can they or sells their business, can the successor take over? Right. But as long as they're meeting these things, then I think it would be for you know some period of time, unless they violate some some sort of condition. Be a real but here, say under Robert's rules, a motion is on the table. So oh. the only appropriate thing to oh, to do it? next is to uh, either second it or let it die for lack of a motion. But uh, the, right, there's second. no second. Yeah. Um, but also I. I was hoping, hoping that I I interrupted the motion, but we could. Oh, but what I had was uh, that you you said that was my motion. So you said you had said move to go forward with the parklet ordinances present. And then I think the mayor said, but before we have a motion, can we? Right. Well, but you're but you're right. But you're right. So I think the problem is she said that was my motion. Yes. So okay. the motion was okay. there. Second. Fair enough. <laughs> okay. Great. Motion and second. Okay. Um, First reading, staff may amend it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, that is, you'll, we'll have two further readings. So, so we will put okay. those in. Right, yeah, but like clarity around how does it end or how does it get renewed? Right. Um, and the other, so the yeah. other key piece in this, just so we're putting it right out there, is we, we have, we had prior to the pandemic assessed people the cost of a parking space for the season. Um, and we did do away with that, and this is proposing to go back to that. So if somebody were parking there full time, you know, because we're fo for, we're letting them use the space and we're foregoing the parking revenue. So that would be a, that, so as I, I would think as long as they're paying their fee, they could keep re-upping. Yeah, yeah. Okay, um, Donna, go ahead. I don't want to see unlimited parklets. <laughs> So at some point they need to change so, over. Uh, they might need to change over. So I would say to that that we could discuss that at first mm -hmm. reading because when it comes. you'll have two readings and 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 I say that not to be fresh, but when we had talked about this earlier, um, we had mentioned not having limits on them. So that's what, so I would, that was the assumption. That was the direction. So I was trying to follow that. So if you want to change that, great. I I, I understand me. Yeah, go ahead. go ahead. I understand we talked about it in the ordinance, but I also don't like your eyes getting so big that you have unlimited 
park that's out there. That's all. Because I, I think there would be pushback at some point. <laughs> well, we can talk about it. Discretion. Um, Jack. I know that this is not the debate on the proposed ordinance or the public reading, but I, I just want to make a couple of comments. One is that I, I really like the idea that as a permanent thing, this puts the uh, approval biz business in the hands of the city manager so the applicants don't have to come to city council each time they want us to do that. You know, we have a professional city uh, management for a reason and this is squarely within it, I think. The other thing has to do with the, uh, with the period of the, of the parklet. You know, a few weeks ago, I was down in uh, Queens visiting my son, and it's a he lives in a very vibrant neighborhood. And one of the things that happened during the pandemic down there was that some restaurants built structures that were enclosed and were able to be uh, used year round. So they're open in the winter as well as in the summer. Now mm -hmm. that raises real practical issues, including snow plowing. Uh, but you know, I reached out to one of the downtown businesses to see whether they, that would be of interest. And uh, there's at least some interest in thinking about it. So I just want to throw that out there as one thing that we might consider um, when we get into the uh, public hearings. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. So there is a motion. Uh, and I don't think we need to end a second, right? And I don't think we necessarily need to change it at this point. Um, so further discussion. Okay. Um, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Okay. It's unanimous. Saw you there online. Thank you. Um, so that uh, passes. And so we're on to uh, time limits for public comments, um, which uh, really the, the question is uh, discussion on whether two minutes is appropriate. Now, to be fair, just so you all are, I think you are all aware of this, but um, uh, I don't actually interrupt people until three minutes. And at that point, it's please wrap up your comments. Um, so functionally, it's it's three minutes, um, but yes. More than that, Kevin. Oh, really? Because I signal you, and it takes you. I mean, it, it usually ends up being more like three thirty is the oh, average really? between when I give the three and you notice it. And oh, 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 And then okay. you have to wait because you're trying to be polite when to interrupt them. So That's true. it's going on almost four minutes when we start with two. Okay. Uh, so. There's a little context there, but want to make sure that um, folks have um, adequate time to make their their comments for sure. I also um, think that it is uh, reasonable to. Uh, I mean, I, I mentioned this briefly tonight, but I think we could probably do um, do this in a more formal way. Uh, you know, inviting folks to submit written comments uh, because I think that is um, welcome. Um, and also, I, there's some other things I want to say about about that, but I'm going to hold on to them for for a minute now. Uh, we did have one person who was here, um, couldn't stay, wrote out some comments. I'm going to read that um, into the record. Um, just wanted to share that. But other other thoughts, uh, Jack. Thank you. I've I've been thinking about this, and I think that uh, that we're. The tension we have is that we want to make sure that people have a reasonable opportunity to make their points. And we also need to have adequate time in our meetings for us to do uh, the business that we have to at each of our meetings. And so what I came up with as an idea is to do two things. One, give each individual more time to talk. And I, I would set it at uh, five minutes and there's nothing magic about that anything any more than there's magic about two minutes. Um, although I've heard a lot of people th say that they think two minutes is 
is unreasonable or like me, I can relate to that. Um, but I would couple that with, uh, with an aggregate time limit on the uh, ge general business of, and appearances. And, and so my proposal would be up to five minutes per person, but a total of 30 minutes, no more than 30 minutes for general business and appearances. So that if there are more than six people who want to speak, that they would each be cut down so that everyone uh, who wants to speak on a, in general business and appearances in a given meeting would have to fill their time in, fill their comments in within 30 minutes. And I do have a written proposal that just says that. Uh, okay. Other thoughts? Uh, Carrie. Yeah, I, I tend to lean towards thinking two minutes is fine. Um, I, I have heard from I have heard from some people that they think it's too short, and I've also heard from others who think it's adequate. I think we one of the the challenges that I see and that I am kind of hearing about when I talk to people about this is the distinction between uh, a public meeting and um, a city council meeting that's open to the public. And so we're trying to get the work of the city council done here with opportunity for public input, for public comment, for public engagement, but it's not quite the same as a meeting of the public. And it does seem that sometimes we talk about topics that invite a lot of public engagement and people want to not just stand up and kind of make their point quickly, but they want to be part of a discussion. So I think that, you know, the Elks Club property is a great example of where people really want to, they want to talk and they want to ask questions and they want to have some back and forth. And so I'm wondering if we might think about some times when we set aside a particular meeting, at, like we did with that one Elks Club meeting, to say, this is a meeting of the public and the city council will be here and we'll be listening, but then we can be much more relaxed about those kind of guidelines. But that within our formal city council meetings, I think we need to we need to make sure that there is plenty of opportunity for public engagement, which includes not allowing a few people to dominate it and take up all the time that means that other people don't get a chance to contribute. So I just want to make sure I'm understanding. So maybe we could have more meetings where I would call it like a single topic meeting. But yeah, a forum. Yeah, a, a public forum on a particular topic to to really like get into it with with uh, public comments. Um, and apparently that's going away. Okay, good. Um, cool. I. I I like that idea. <laughs> All right, um, Connor. Yeah, I, I think I'd lean towards that. Um, I actually think like having a longer comment could be a deterrent to public engagement. Um, you know, I've had people say, like, look how bloody long your meetings are. You know, it's 11 o'clock right now. If you look at everybody who would have exceeded two minutes here, we'd be here another hour plus, not even with general business and appearances thrown in. So. I like a public forum here or there if, if it warrants it, you know, and we can sit back and yeah, let folks go. But um, I, I, I think two minutes is adequate for getting, getting the job of the meeting done. It, it, to Carrie's point, um, you know, when we have a public hearing, even in our meeting, like for an ordinance, I mean, that really, those are for the express purpose of hearing from the public. And so maybe we would allow those to go longer but at an agenda item you know we can say hey we'll take a couple comments but we're you know but we have a long tradition here of listening to the public and having you know encouraging public and you know I, you have to balance it somehow an interesting thought to to consider that for specifically public hearings that maybe the rules are more relaxed but maybe not i mean if that in a way that those are the times often when well, not, not necessarily like sometimes there are, you know, multiple people that will come for a public hearing, but sometimes the public hearings are, you know, nobody shows up. So anyway, just, just thinking out loud here. Ask, 
as you make this decision, how often this has really been a, a problem or contested occasion with, with, you know, a couple obvious exceptions. Most people get to say what they want to say, and they, um, it, you know, every now and then you had a guy tonight say, hey, can I just have a couple? couple more seconds and you're like sure finish up you know i mean i think yeah um do you want to go to jennifer and then we'll go to donna yeah sorry i don't need to um i agree that like i feel like two minutes is probably two to four minutes is plenty of time um i know for me when people go longer than that i start to tune out because I'm ready to go on to the next thing or hear the next person. And for me, it's an attention, <laughs> it's an attention span thing. It's not a people thing. Um, but I do feel like most folks have gotten in the year that I've been doing this, most people have gotten their points across pretty quickly. And I don't, I don't feel like drawing it out is going to help us getting business done. I feel like it'll just continue to track our meetings at just a little bit longer than we would Oh, for. Uh, thank you. Yeah, uh, Donna. I mean, Robert's Rules of Order was created in 1876 because they were trying to balance some order from the group's process of getting something done and the individual expression. And so council meetings, I'm sorry, folks, I want to hear your opinions. I want to have time to sift through them. And we're only required by open meeting law to have public comments. We do not have to allow people to talk on every single topic in the agenda. We do, and that's wonderful. But I just would like to go back to the basis of we're here for council business. And I'd like not to be here and be a little brain dead so late. I'd like to have more compact meetings, hear one another, and have input, but have it contained. But one of the problems with asking people to give us written stuff or email us or call us is that one, we don't all share our emails. We don't all enter it in the record. So I think we may need to look at that as how do we share emails or put it in the record or give it to the staff to send to us. Um, so then, then they know it matters that it gets entered. Um, that's, that's my concern. Um, uh, so just wanna note, I've got some ideas actually been chatting about with Peter Kellerman about um, how we can better incorporate um, written uh, testimony into the particularly general business and appearances. Um, so anyway, perhaps a, another discussion um, for that, but I, um, I think there's some potential there. Um, I do want to make sure that I read this uh, note from Mary Messier. Do you, you know, you know, Mary. Um, Okay, so she says, um, I do not think two minutes is an adequate amount of time for public comment. This said, under, in understanding that giving some limits is necessary so that meetings can move along, uh, simply at this time, I feel four minutes would give persons a, a feeling of a less pressure in presenting their views and knowing that not every person will need four minutes. Uh, people under less pressure of watching time, I feel may be better able to um, better able to present their views in a timely fashion. This directly relates to community involvement. Thank you. And PS, this could be tried to see how it goes. Um, so it also makes me wonder if I should be clear that, you know, when I, at the beginning, I'm like, oh yeah, try to keep your comments at two minutes. I don't tell people, I'm actually going to interrupt you at three and really, you know, you know Okay. <laughs> okay. And, and if you want it more exact, I mean, it's hard. I get involved sometimes and forget to push a button. Yeah. I missed one person tonight totally yeah. because he was all mingled with presenters. And I didn't realize, yeah. oh, he's right. not a presenter. Right. Right. You gotta, you gotta, so, I mean, uh, if you want it more exact, I can do it. But I usually give everybody a leeway of at least about 20 seconds because okay. I don't always see it right away. There but. are some places that have like Wait, our glasses that's or right. I have mean, timers. I could um, set a timer and it goes off, and then you know, everybody so absolutely. How much, yep. Yeah. I, I think our have. system is okay. I know. I, I'm just saying. Is that I well, but, but I'm just saying if you want. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Okay, well, it, it seems like there's a consensus to keep it as it is right now. That's the sense I'm getting. Um, sorry, Jack, um, but <laughs> there we are. Um, so, okay, great, <laughs> fair enough. Uh, all right, so we are through our business. Uh, wow, it lists the mayor's report first. So I'm gonna go first, which is to say I'm gonna pass. Donna. <laughs> might be able to vote August 9th. Oh, yes. And also there's been a lot of discussion about the Berry Street two-way bike lane and just refer people to the Main Street, Berry Street bicycle and pedestrian study that is on the website. And we did that in September, 2019 after we spent a year and a half and we had a lot of public input, but it was a long time ago. So if people would read that, they would understand what we're trying to do with this project on Berry Street. Thank you. Gary. Yeah. Connor. I think, I think we probably all said it in our own way, but um, we haven't had a meeting since the passing of Warren Kitzmiller there. Um, yeah, and yeah. just, you know, I, I don't think we can say enough about his contributions to the community and uh, just what a kind soul he was. He was a neighbor of mine. And always a pleasure to see the dog Bodie and, uh, you know, uh, just the impact he made on people's lives. So I think we, yeah. we all share, share that loss collectively. Yeah. Thank you, Connor. Yeah. Uh, Jack. I will pass. Okay, John. Uh, a couple things. Uh, for just so you all know, early voting is very high overall, higher than I thought. It's about a thousand requests. Uh, I still have volunteer needs. I sent out an email to the whole BCA, um, so I do need some help. Obviously, these two can't. But um, no. yeah, so take a look at that. And Donna already is. So, <laughs> um, and also. I wanted to note the passing of Paul Giuliani, um, who has been well, he's a great guy, he certainly helped me out plenty, and he's been a presence in the city and the community for forever. So, yeah, thank you. Uh, and Bill. Well, John, John beat me to my punch about Paul Giuliani. He, he, two of us attended his funeral together yesterday, and. Paul not only was uh, you know, a huge presence in the city, uh, he was also a neighbor uh, of mine, uh, but he really around the state for municipal governments. He really uh, was one of the go-to people for towns and cities all over. Um, and certainly when it came to financing, uh, bond financing, but really any general laws, working with the League of Cities and Towns, testifying at the legislature, dealing with charter issues and um, and it always gave you an answer pretty quick. That was one of the things I liked about Paul. Short and sweet and to the point. Uh, yeah, well, heck yes, you can do that. <laughs> so I, I will miss him personally and professionally. He was a, a great guy with whom I disagreed with on almost everything outside of work, but we got along famously. <laughs> Uh, that's good. Uh, well, thank you. Um, all right, so without objection, we will... Adjourn 1119. Whew, we made it.